Good morning. Officers, you can, you can let our people in back there, they? Good morning. Subcommittee will come to order. In 1980, Chairman of this subcommittee, along with a number of my colleagues, sponsored Title VII of the Energy Security Act of 1980, which is known as the Asset Precipitation Act of 1980. The, that law established a task force to coordinate an interagency funded asset precipitation research program spanning 10 years and to issue reports thereon, including, when appropriate, recommendations to the administration and Congress. More than $300 million in taxpayers' funds has been devoted to that effort, which is now just over half complete. At that time, it was the goal of the Congress to establish a national inquiry into the causes and the consequences of acid rain and acid precipitation, to find out what the perils were, what the policy changes should be, what the benefits of policy changes should be, and to make a general and a careful study of a broad intercontinental and continental problem with regard to acid precipitation and its consequences. This was, of course, an enormously complex problem which needed careful scientific study and analysis to come to a wise and sensible national policy which would be in the broad public interest. The facts are always urgently needed before policy decisions can be wisely, soundly, and properly made. Last month, the task force, which is headed by the administrator of EPA, issued a long-term and a long-awaited interim assessment of the results thus far of this important taxpayer-funded research. The assessment is a four-volume document, including an executive summary. The preliminary conclusions that I draw from this four-volume interim assessment is that it is a good technical product. It contains much information of great value, but that certain uncertainties still remain. There is a pollution problem. It is not just an acid rain problem. The questions are what then should be done and what are the dimensions of the problem which dictate government policy, enforcement action, and other questions which should be <coughs> properly addressed. Obviously, there is more time needed and more research will be required to complete a 10-year program now approximately halfway through. There appears to be, on the basis of this study, no emergency. Yet, it can be observed that only a few hours after this multi-volume detailed assessment was issued, some appeared to denigrate the good faith of the many scientists and others in the federal agencies who had worked long and hard to prepare it. They imply at least that the task force agencies and scientists and Dr. Culp, the executive director, cooked the facts to suit the administration's position by ignoring other studies that are inconsistent and selectively relying on others. One individual, Mr. Gene E. Likens, wrote in a September 20 letter that the executive summary badly misrepresented the general scientific understanding about air pollution and acid deposition. He said, the report either ignored or discounted out of hand the thousands of articles published in high quality scientific journals which show serious ecological damage caused by air pollution and acid deposition. If true, these charges are serious. My present view is that these charges are based only on a partial reading of the assessment and not necessarily on, an, on a full review of the entire four-volume work. But it is my intention to find out what the facts are, whether the charges are valid, and whether, in fact, the work has been carefully and properly done. <coughs> We have asked our panel to respond to these questions today. The taxpayers have paid good money for a comprehensive research program and effort which is incomplete. Naturally, one may expect disagreements. Scientists do disagree. I hope that all can agree that this effort has been conducted in good faith and that these scientists and federal personnel are trying to narrow the uncertainties and to do good scientific research work. 
The committee is concerned also about the management of the remaining research effort, particularly with the resignation of Dr. Culp. The committee will want to be assured that actions will be taken which will replace him and other personnel as needed and to assure that high quality personnel and scientists are available to continue this work. Today, the committee will also examine EPA's report of Canada's efforts as compared to the United States in controlling air pollution. Last month, EPA issued a new report by ICF Inc. on Canada's air pollution program, including Canada's plans between now and 1994. That report shows that Canada, particularly Ontario, has done well. However, the problem is quite significant in Canada, particularly in Ontario in the 1970s. As the report shows, Ontario's 1986 emissions were 1,333 tons, which was over 59% below the level in 1970 of 3,226,000 tons. Most <coughs> of that decline comes from only two sources, namely two non-ferrous smelters. The ICF report states, however, from 1970 to 1979, emission reductions, for the most part, were due to process modifications at the two smelters. However, strikes at these two facilities caused large production cutbacks in 1978 and 79. After 1979, the general trend towards reduced emissions was primarily due to production declines. This tells me that the process of cleaning the air in Canada is less related to air pollution abatement efforts than it is to economic circumstances and shutdown of facility. The report goes on to make another observation. It says, in 1970, copper and nickel smelters accounted for 72% of total SO2 emissions. The next largest category of emissions in 1970 was Ontario Hydro, which counted for 11% of the total. In 19, it goes on. In 1986, the copper and nickel smelters were still the largest source of SO2 emissions, but their share of the total had declined from 72% to 54%. Total SO2 emissions by copper and nickel smelters declined from 2,334,000 tons in 1970 to 725,000 tons in 1986. Again, of course, the question must be asked, do these reductions relate to a regulatory and control program which is cleaning the air or to economic circumstances, shutdowns, and reduction of in, in production levels. Canada has announced a new regulatory program, which Canada says will result in 50% further reductions. We welcome that and applaud such efforts. However, ICF states that the new program will achieve by 1994 a 35% reduction, not a 50% reduction below actual emission levels. We will also examine the adequacy of research concerning the claims of a decline of ducts allegedly due to acidifications. This is a concern to a number of interested citizens, and I think it is a matter into which there should be an honest and a careful inquiry based on scientific fact and not upon shouting or upon lack of adequate information and judgment. Finally, the subcommittee will revisit a number of issues relative to safety associated with the volatility of gasoline, the use of oxygenated fuels, and the installation of onboard controls on automobiles and other vehicles. At our hearing in April, the subcommittee pointed out that the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety opposed the use of onboard controls for safety reasons. The Institute's president reiterated that view only last Monday in another subcommittee belonging to, this, uh, to our parent subcommittee. In June, the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration raised a number of safety concerns and doubt. It can be observed that despite this, EPA, without responding to specific NHTSA concerns, proposed regulations in July calling for onboard controls. Only a few days ago, a third safety agency, the well-respected National Transportation Safety Board, wrote the subcommittee saying, Based on the safety board's review, the onboard technology as, pro as proposed by EPA and as demonstrated by various parties does have the potential to increase hazards due to fire and explosion that could put people at risk. These potential hazards result from possible failure modes of the system. 
In addition, there are potential hazards due to fire in the event of a collision that must be addressed. <coughs> Test results are not available to determine the magnitude of these hazards. Adequate lead time, appropriate engineering and testing may make it possible to eliminate the potential hazards. It is important to assure ourselves that we do not exchange one hazard, that is hydrocarbon emissions, for a worse hazard such as fire and explosion. Only non-safety experts at EPA firmly believe that onboard controls are safe or can be made safe given enough time. For EPO, EPA, however, enough time is only two years. Most others familiar with this safety issue believe that at least four years is essential, although even then safety is in doubt. Motor vehicle manufacturers are, in, are of course faced with certain scheduling problems. As noted, it takes only 24 months under the proposal for all vehicles, including buses and heavy duty trucks, to be required to meet the standards. Yet now EPA wants them to suggest other lead time and guess whether or not EPA will adopt it. The vice president has called this approach akin to advanced notice proposal proposed of rulemaking. One must inquire whether in fact it is an adequate rulemaking process. It is apparently an effort, in part at least, to redraw the debate from the issue of safety and complexity of the system to one of lead time. EPA suggests that they may provide more lead time, but they refuse to admit that two years is inadequate or to commit to any specific time. Today, NHTSA suggests that onboard systems will not improve and could degrade safety. One must inquire whether we are compelled by the needs of the circumstances before us to put at risk the driving public and the, and the American people to vehicles which will be less than safe on the basis of information at hand. If I am compelled to choose sides in this matter, I will side with the safety agencies and I will expect EPA to show before any rule is issued that onboard controls will be safe for all covered vehicles, whatever the lead time. I will expect that NHTSA will do like. The consequences of wrong guesses, whether they are educated or not, can be deaths of passengers, drivers, and, Amer and innocent Americans. In the effort, the committee will expect compliance with law, objectivity, fairness, and, uh, and the most proper behavior by all agencies. EPA has been challenged in this matter, and I'm aware that some careerists are somewhat shaken by the challenge from the three safety agencies. The subcommittee, however, will continue its oversight to ensure that the regulated industry and consumers are treated fairly, properly, and objectively. I am sure that Director Thomas wants that as well. I would observe that the other day, the governor of California, who deserves commendation, vetoed a bill requiring onboard controls in that state. I understand that safety was principal amongst his concerns. Obviously, the administration could learn from the action of that governor with regard to safety concerns, uh, which must be addressed. The uh, chair announces that uh, Mr. Bliley, our good friend from Virginia, senior member of the subcommittee, has uh, requested that a statement by him be inserted in the record. Without objection, that will be done at this time. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to keep my statement brief. After five years of struggling to get an acid rain bill passed, the last thing I want to do is contribute to a delay. That would be like shooting myself in the foot. And as you know, I've only got nine toes left. Uh, we have an eclectic collection of witnesses and issues before us today. Lee Thomas will address Canada's progress in implementing pollution control legislation. This is an issue of some concern given Canada's criticism of the United States. We will hear that the Canadian acid rain law will result in a 35 percent reduction in SO2 emissions instead of the 50 percent reduction they've advertised. I'm glad that this committee has been able to play a positive role in exposing that shortfall in the Canadian program, and I trust the Canadian government will act to improve their law. We should take note of the fact, however, that Canada has an acid rain law, which is more than can be said tragically about our country. If the Can Canadians reduce SO2 emissions by 35 percent, that will be 35 percent more than we've delivered. And as most of us know, we cause half of the Canadian problem. 
Mr. Thomas will also take questions on the National Asset Precipitation Assessment Program's interim assessment, which was recently released. Dr. Culp, Director of NAPAP, submitted his resignation last weekend, so I understand he will not be testifying today as uh, scheduled. Given the controversy surrounding his acid rain study, the timing, I guess he is here, so uh, thank you, Dr. Culp, uh, for raising your hand, or else I would have given uh, some inaccurate information. I regret, uh, due to a previous commitment in Minnesota, not be able to stay for all of the testimony, especially the testimony of Frank Dunkel, Director of uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. He will be addressing the issue of great importance to me in my state, the impact of acid rain on waterfall. The possible link between wetland acidification and declining duck populations was raised in a study by Paul Hansen of the Isaac Walton League and has generated some controversy. I have some questions for Mr. Dunkel on this issue, which I'll submit for the record. For now, I would just like to make a few comments on the NAPAP report and our efforts to enact acid rain control legislation. Over 6,000 different acid rain studies and reports and research documents are gathering dust on the bookshelves of America. So you wouldn't expect another massive tome of, to generate such attention. But the NAPAP report has provoked a major controversy and the reasons aren't hard to understand. While scientific research outside the defense sector struggles for funding, over $300 million, I'm told, in taxpayers' <laughs> money has been poured into this acid rain research. And at that price, we have a right and duty to insist that the product be valid in its method and objective in its presentation. <coughs> the NAPAP report fails to pass the test. I'd like to submit for the record as part of my statement an editorial from the St. Paul Pioneer uh, Press Dispatch that deals with the report's conclusions. It points out some of the Without many... The objection the document referred to will be inserted in the record at the appropriate place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It points out the, some of the flaws, it, it, uh, such as setting the lake acidification threshold at an unreasonable level, ignoring the lake's ability to neutralize acid, limiting the scope of the report to lakes 10 acres or larger in area, unrealistically forecasting shifts in electric power generation that would cause significant reductions in future emissions, and underestimating the damage that acid rain and ozone are doing to forests in both <coughs> the United States and Canada. It concludes, this editorial concludes that NAPAP study offers no justification for further delay in controlling the emissions that cause acid rain. That view is shared by top scientists in the field, many of whom have spoken out against uh, this report. We can do more than study the acid rain problem. Every day we have the ingenuity and the capacity to solve the crisis and we do not act on it. Is a day too late. We have begun discussions among the committee members on a range of Clean Air Act issues and it's my sincere hope that those talks will lead to legislation which is both acceptable to the committee and good for the environment. In my state of Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes and highly vulnerable to acidification, reducing acid rain is no luxury. It's not just good for the environment, it's a bread and butter issue. Mr. Chairman, if we look past the rosy summary of this NAPAP report and into its data and other credible scientific work in the field, one can only conclude that we have a problem on our hands Let's work together to find a way to deal with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the chair announces that the panel today will be composed of the following. Mr. J. Dexter Peach, Director, Resources, Community and Economic Development Division of the General Accounting Office, accompanied by Mr. William McGee, Mr. Dennis Parker, and Mr. Barry Bedrick. The Honorable Lee M. Thomas, Administrator, Environmental Protection Agency, accompanied by Mr. Eugene Hester, Mr. Paul Ringgold, Dr. Larry Culp, uh, Mr. Andrew Sins, uh, the, and the Honorable Frank E. Dunkel, Director, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of the Interior. Mr. Dunkel is accompanied by Mr. Mr. Richard N. Smith, Regional Director, Region 8 Research Division, and by the Honorable Diane K. Steed, Administrator, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Department of Transportation. She's accompanied by Ms. Eric Jones, Chief Count Erica Jones, Chief Counsel, uh, Mr. Barry Fel Felrice, Associate Administrator for Rulemaking, Mr. George Parker, Associate Administrator for Enforcement, and Mr. Ralph Hitchcock. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the committee this morning. Thank you for being here and thank you for your assistance. Chair advises that it is the practice of this committee and has been since its first days that all witnesses are sworn uh, do any of you have any objections to testifying under oath? Um, it is your, your right to be accompanied by counsel if you so desire. Do any of you desire to be accompanied by counsel? 
Uh, the chair observes that copies of the rules of the committee, rules of the House, the rules of the subcommittee are there at the table for your information. Will you, um, uh, if, if you have no objection to testifying under oath, will you see to it that um, you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you each swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Got it. You may each consider yourself then to be under oath. The chair will recognize you in <coughs> this order. First, Mr. Peach, then Mr. Thomas, uh, then uh, Mr. Dunkel, and did we, did we miss Ms. Steed? Oh, and then, and then Ms. Steed. We, I wanted to make sure I didn't lose you. Uh, Ms. Peach, you are, you are recognized for your statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, statement that I'd like to place in the record, and I'd like to proceed with a summary of that statement, uh, which we have. Uh, my statement today discusses two reports that we've recently issued dealing with national air pollution issues. One on the progress of the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, or NAPAP. The other addresses the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed action to reduce gasoline vapors from motor vehicles. Let me start with the NAPAP report. You ask us to look at NAPAP's research program, including the status of its assessment documents and effective management changes. In that report, we noted management problems that contributed to delays in issuing the assessments, as well as other documents. We also noted, among other things, that NAPAP had reduced its efforts to evaluate economic effects of acid rain controls, although such evaluation is required by law. Among the recommendations we made to deal with these problems are that the Joint Chairs Council give high priority to issuing assessment documents and other reports, examine NAPAP's staffing situation, determine where the delays occur and eliminate bottlenecks, and identify economic information needed to assess the acidic deposition issue and ensure that associated analysis be undertaken. In addition, we observed that the establishment of an external scientific committee could give more credibility to NAPAP's overall research program, although we did not make a recommendation along those lines. In responding to that report, the Joint Chairs Council generally indicated that it would respond in a positive way to our recommendations, but we nevertheless have some continuing concerns about NAPAP's ability to issue assessments that are both timely and substantive. First, and as you noted, with only three years remaining to issue the final assessment, and with the recent resignation of the Director of Research, it is imperative that NAPAP soon be provided with sufficient staff to carry out its mission. Second, given the controversy surrounding the September 17, 87 release of NAPAP's first assessment document, it seems to us even more logical to believe that some form of comprehensive external review could enhance the scientific consensus for the final assessment. Yet NAPAP has decided not to establish such a review process. Third, the problems resulting from a multi-agency structure increase NAPAP's difficulties in issuing timely documents. For example, the director has little authority to control the budget or direct task group leaders. Also, since the participating agencies sometimes have conflicting positions, it is often difficult to obtain consensus on issues. NAPAP's past difficulties in reaching consensus and issuing policy-relevant assessments indicate that it could experience similar delays in developing the final assessment. Given these problems, the Joint Chairs Council will need to take a stronger and more visible management role over the next three years. In particular, we need the council members will need to be more active in assuring timely resolution of differences between the Office of the Director and agency representatives if the assessment process is to be kept on track. NAPAP officials believe they will have sufficient information by 1990 to serve as a basis for policy recommendations on acidic deposition controls. However, they acknowledge that uncertainties about the causes and effects of acidic deposition will remain. Let me underline the uncertainty in this area and caution that any decision on whether or not to control acid rain now or in the future is likely to be made with some degree of scientific uncertainty, because as with many science policy issues, definitive answers may never be known. In addition to the scientific unknowns, value judgments and political concerns become integral parts of the decision-making process. In light of this, we believe that decision makers will continue to be faced with weighing these risks of potentially avoidable environmental damage against the risk of economic impact from acid rain control programs that may prove to not be effective in really dealing with the problem. 
Let me turn, Mr. Chairman, to EPA's efforts to control refueling and evaporative emissions for motor vehicles. Uh, as you know, EPA recently proposed two rules to reduce the emissions, which were published shortly after we issued a report to you on the process that they had been going through. <coughs> to reduce refueling emissions, they would require motor vehicle manufacturers to equip vehicles with onboard control systems. This alternative was chosen over the other option, requiring service station owners and operators to install stage two vapor recovery equipment on their fuel pumps. To reduce the evaporative emissions, they would require oil refiners to lower the volatility of commercial gasoline consumers used in their vehicles. EPA favored this option over another that would equate the volatility of gasoline used to certify current vehicle evaporative emission systems with that of commercial gasoline, modifying those systems as needed. Not surprisingly, in both proposals, the motor vehicle industry and the oil industry have taken the position that the other should implement the needed controls. EPA has stated that the onboard controls have several advantages over stage two controls in reducing refueling emissions. For example, onboard controls are expected to provide greater long-term emission reductions at similar or better cost effectiveness, result in a greater number of cancer incident reductions associated with exposure to benzene and gasoline vapors, and provide automatic coverage in all areas of the country, including areas in marginal attainment with the ozone standard. We should point out, however, as an indication of the trade-offs involved in EPA's decision, that stage two controls are estimated to provide greater emission reductions in the early years and more cost effective when only ozone non-attainment area emission reductions are counted. The differences continue to exist between EPA, the motor vehicle industry, and others concerning onboard control cost, implementation time, and safety. For example, EPA estimates onboard controls will increase each vehicle's price by $19, whereas motor vehicle manufacturers' cost estimates range from $30 to $115. Further, the manufacturers estimate it would take four to six years rather than EPA's estimates of two years to begin installing onboard controls. The overall safety of onboard controls, particularly as it relates to implementation time, is another area of disagreement. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that three to four years rather than EPA's anticipated two-year lead time may be needed to give motor vehicle manufacturers sufficient time to design, test, and install onboard controls and to properly address uh, the safety issue. Regarding the efforts to reduce evaporative emissions, the rise in gasoline volatility over the past several years has caused most motor vehicles to emit evaporative hydrocarbons in excess of allowable federal standards. To correct this problem, EPA proposes to reduce commercial gasoline volatility during the summer months to a level closer to that of gasoline use to certify the currently installed evaporative emission controls. This proposal, which can be implemented within months, is the only short-term strategy available to reduce evaporative emissions. EPA expects this proposed strategy to reduce hydrocarbon emissions nationwide by 6% in 1989 and by 9% in 1992, while raise, raising gasoline prices about one cent or less per gallon. Motor vehicle manufacturers' cost estimates for reducing commercial gasoline volatility are generally less than EPA's estimates, making the proposal even more attractive to implement. Conversely, the oil refineries' cost estimates are much greater, making EPA's proposal less desirable than the approach they support which is to raise certification gasoline volatility and modify vehicle controls. The DPA draft analysis we reviewed provided useful information on cost and benefits of various control strategies, but we did identify several issues EPA should address as it moves forward in the rulemaking process. Uh, these generally uh, relate to providing better information on the ranking of strategies and how they would be affected by changes in different assumptions about key uncertain costs and benefits of the strategies. And we made recommend recommendations to try to uh, address those shortcomings. In summary, Mr. Chairman, EPA's proposal to lower commercial gasoline volatility is the only short-term control available for reducing motor vehicle emissions, and it would achieve by far the largest reduction in <laughs> hydrocarbon emissions, six to nine percent. Onboard control proposals would also help to reduce emissions by a factor of two percent but it will take many years before the reductions can be realized. Further, the safety issue needs to be resolved before the onboard control strategy can be implemented. If that issue is not resolved, or if it is determined that refueling emissions need to be reduced as quickly as possible, then stage two controls in non-attainment areas remain a viable alternative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it concludes my statement. Uh, we'll be pleased to answer your questions after the other members of the panel have completed their statement. Thank you, Mr. Peach. Mr. Thomas? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm accompanied by Dr. Larry Kopp, who's director of research, as you know, for the NAPAP program to assist me in responding to questions concerning that report. Let me summarize my statement. Uh, you have the full statement for submission, uh, submitted for inclusion in the record. That would be appropriate without objection, so ordered. I'll comment on a number of issues which you have asked us to discuss today. Current status of NAPAP, scientific understanding of acid rain, Canadian acid rain program, as well as the safety of motor vehicle onboard refuel and gas volatility controls which we have proposed. First, let me talk about NAPAP. It was a joint effort, as you indicated, that was authorized by Congress in 1980. And basically, 12 government agencies have participated in an overall research effort to look at the scientific questions associated with acid rain. I've been the chairman for the last three years, three, three years of the Joint Chairs Committee, which is basically the overseeing body for that joint government effort. That body, in 1985, reviewed and revised the Memorandum of Understanding by which those agencies worked together. In that Memorandum of Understanding, we updated and specified the responsibilities of the Director of Research, who since that time has been Dr. Call, as it relates to the Joint Chairs as well as the Interagency Science Committee and the Interagency Policy Committee, which are the basic groups that work on the issues associated with the research under this program. The report that GAO did on the overall management of NAPAP, we found generally constructive. The recommendations that they made, we generally support. For instance, their notes concerning staff resources and staffing for NAPAP, we agree with. We established those overall staffing levels as a result of the work of Dr. Culp and the Joint Chairs subsequent to that 98, 1985 Memorandum of Understanding. We intend to ensure that those staff positions are filled and ensure that there's adequate staff in the Director of Research's office to carry forward with the work of that program. As you noted, Dr. Culp has resigned. There's a resignation that I had anticipated because of Dr. Culp's interest in broadening his activities, personal reasons to pursue other interests. However, because of his commitment to the work of NAPAP, his dedication to the science and ensuring that the interim assessment was completed, he withheld that resignation until we were able to publish the interim assessment report. Commend him for that and I commend him for the work he's done over the last two years as director of research. We're moving quickly to replace Dr. Culp with another scientist who has the same level of qualifications that Dr. Culp brought to the program, which were very extensive. I can assure you that we will continue with a strong effort both as far as management and science is concerned under that joint agency effort to improve our scientific knowledge on acid rain. Turning specifically to the interim assessment, which was published just recently, and the controversy surrounding that publication, let me just make a few comments. First, I think the interim assessment represents a very significant event as far as acid rain research is concerned. I think it is, in fact, the largest body of scientific information which has been compiled in one series of documents in the world concerning this issue. And in fact, I feel it is an excellent document. It is a document that truly is comprehensive, covering many of the issues we debate and have debated over the last number of years, and represents, I believe, a current status as far as scientific knowledge is concerned about acid rain. It also is a document that was contributed to by hundreds of scientists who have participated in this scientific work over the last numbers of years. It went through an extensive peer review or external review process as it was developed. Now the findings are many, and as you indicated, there are volumes that cover anything from aquatics effects to forest effects to any number of other issues associated with acid rain, and I won't attempt to try to go through those findings, but I will say that the findings, I believe, in the executive summary, the conclusions that are drawn there, are basically reflective of what's in the detailed volumes. 
primary findings were brought forward into that executive summary. And in fact, I believe the executive summary is a fair review of the findings themselves. Obviously, in any summary, that's what it is, is a summary. To go to the body of the report, because that's where all of the conclusions, all of the findings, and the body of the information is entailed. I believe when the full report is reviewed by scientists, they will agree with me it is an excellent scientific assessment of this issue. As far as overall findings are concerned, I would only highlight a couple before we get to questions. First, clearly it documents that acid rain, acid deposition is a phenomena that is well documented, both in our country and others. It talks about the precursors of acid rain, of sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds, and I think it provides us with new knowledge, or documents knowledge that is new concerning those precursors, possibly leading us to conclude that we should be increasingly concerned about hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides as we look at this phenomena of acid deposition. It talks about the impact on aquatic resources of acid deposition, specifically restates the findings of the surveys that were done by EPA, both of Eastern Lakes and Western Lakes, and published last year. It also indicates some of the work that has been done on stream surveys that are yet, yet to be fully complete. We find that there are a number of lakes in the Northeast, Southeast, other parts of the country that have been acidified. And there is a review of levels of acidification of those lakes. There's also review of acid neutralizing capacity of those lakes. And it is stated in extensive detail what those findings are, consistent with the reports that we published last year. It goes on to indicate, however, that particularly in the Northeast, the glaciated areas of the Northeast, we feel that those lakes have reached a steady state phase, that is, at current level of emission, there's no indication that additional lakes will become acidified. It's a very important finding, I believe, or conclusion in the scientific understanding that is represented in this report. That is the steady state phase in the Northeast. It also goes on to say, we do not think there is a steady state phase that has been reached in the Southeast, for instance. It's reflective, I think, of the increased understanding of of the watershed, lake, and mineralization interaction that goes on and contributes to the overall issue of acidification in lakes and streams. It talks at length about aquatic effects, fish as well as biota in the report. It talks about the sensitivity of the lakes in the west, low acid neutralizing capacity, but it also talks about the fact that we don't have acidified lakes in the West at this point in time. As a matter of fact, we didn't find lakes with acidity pH levels below 6 in the West, but clearly lakes that were very sensitive because of very low acid neutralizing capacity. As we turn to forest effects, clearly indicated that at this point, we're still in the midst of extensive ongoing research with our forest effects program under NAPAP. We had not at this time, however, found an effect from acid deposition on forest, particularly through the seedlings research program. We do feel that air pollutants may well be one of the stresses associated with forest decline in some places, particularly high elevation areas. But again, extensive research is underway, and I feel over the next two years, this is one of the major uncertainties that will be addressed. Likewise, as far as materials and materials damage is concerned, again, ongoing research and ongoing efforts to try to document the extent and the amount and the effects as far as acid deposition on materials. As far as agricultural crops, fairly well documented evidence, I believe, that acid deposition is not a contributing factor as far as crop decline, although it's noted that ozone as an independent pollutant has been shown to have substantial impact on some crops. The report goes on to review at length the work which is currently underway and has been underway both in and out of government associated with health effects from acid aerosols, 
as well as visibility impacts associated with these pollutants. Additionally, it talks about the progress that's been made in the United States as far as emission declines are concerned during the last number of years, specifically the 27 percent SO2 reduction from 1970 to 1985. But it also notes the fact that as far as nitrogen oxides are concerned, we've seen an increase. Likewise, as far as ozone or volatile organic compounds which contribute to ozone, we've also seen increases. And then we begin to turn to future emission trends, and we see in both of these areas the potential for increase. Nitrogen oxides, as well as hydrocarbons or ozone, and there are any number of scenarios that are presented for all pollutants, including sulfur dioxide, for the future. There's a full explanation, I believe, of the impact of technology and the potential technology may have as far as each of these pollutants. Sulfur dioxide, for instance, could be reduced dramatically as new technology is applied both to utilities and other sources. Likewise, we could see dramatic decreases in nitrogen oxide. Ozone, as you know, is one of our more difficult pollutants to control, but there again, we lay out concerted strategy could result in control and reductions of ozone as well. Clearly, the report not only identifies what is known in great detail as far as science is concerned, but also what is not known and what is the subject of ongoing research, whether it be aquatic effects, forest effects, material effects, ongoing efforts as far as understanding atmospheric and chemical transformation. The NAPAP report is an aggressive ongoing research program. We've tried to quantify those things which we felt would be better known during the next two years as we aim towards our final report. Clearly, as far as policy is concerned and the policy implications of this report, it is one more document and one more report to be used as we make policy decisions. I, like the members of this committee, have participated in discussions on policy associated with acid rain for the last number of years. We basically talk about the risk of continued emissions and the effects of acid rain, the cost as far as controls are concerned, timing for implementation of additional control. All of those discussions, I think, will continue, and I think we will find differences between us as to how those differences will be resolved. I would say I think this body of information which has been presented in the interim assessment gives us clearly additional information to use particularly as we look at the risk side and the timing side <coughs> of the equation. Let me turn for a moment now to two final points. One, our study of the emissions control program in Canada. As you know, uh, that study uh, requested uh, by your committee uh, was a study which found that Clearly, there's a very different problem as far as emissions are concerned in Canada than in the U.S. because of their very different set of sources. For instance, six smelters and one power plant in Canada account for 60 percent of the sulfur dioxide emissions in that country. It's very different than the hundreds of sources that, that would account for that same percentage of emissions in the United States. Likewise, we found that Canada has a very different program for dealing with those sources of emissions than we do in the United States. Obviously, their governmental processes are different with their federal and provincial and parliamentary form of government, with their providence carrying more authority and responsibility than our states do for actually implementing emissions control programs. As far as standards are concerned, we found they were basically similar as far as their ambient standards are concerned for these pollutants, as well as their mobile source standards, which were upgraded several years ago and basically now are consistent with U.S. standards both for cars and trucks. The acid rain program, which was announced in 1984 in Canada with a goal of reductions by 1994 of 50 percent from the 1980 levels, is a program that's well underway in that country with the large emitting provinces already adopting regulations and in the process of their implementation. It will, as you indicated, result, we believe, in about a 35 percent reduction from 1980 levels of sulfur dioxide. It may result in more. 
depending upon the stringency by which Canada implements it pro its program. But the program which they have currently put in place, we think by 1994, will result in an emissions cap, which is approximately 35 percent beneath the 1980 level. We commend Canada for the program they put in place and for the aggressiveness by which they're moving forward with its implementation. Clearly, along with that program, Canada and the United States have launched over the last several years an intensive process to review United States emissions which cross boundary and impact Canada. The Prime Minister and the President, as you know, two years ago acknowledged the serious nature of these environmental problems. A process was undertaken which the U.S. is fully implementing to go forward with a number of actions, including the aggressive development of new technology to control emissions the precursor pollutants. Additionally, last year the President and Prime Minister announced an effort to review and determine whether protocol would be developed requiring further controls on U.S. emissions results in transboundary pollution. This process is actively underway. Intensive discussions between the countries has gone on for the last number of months. Let me turn to the final issue which you asked me to comment on. That is, our proposed rules related to onboard controls for refueling emissions in automobiles. This is an issue which has probably been studied more than virtually any issue that our agency has been involved in. In the 70s and 80s, technical review was undertaken. Cost-benefit analysis was, underdone, was undertaken, as well as risk assessment related to the emissions, as well as both health and environmental impact those emissions would have in the form of ozone formation. Clearly, over the last uh, year, as I have been particularly involved in finalizing a proposal uh, on this regulation, questions were raised concerning whether onboard controls would result in an increased safety hazard as far as vehicles are concerned. We and EPA are committed to resolving this question before that regulation is finalized. And as you know, in the proposal of several months ago uh, on this regulation, we, in fact, have indicated that that question would be the subject of intensive review after the comments have been received, both from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration as well as other sources. And then those, those issues and our conclusions concerning those issues would be submitted for full public comment before a final review and final decision was made concerning this issue. There is a process now, which I think is a formal process and a public process, both for input and review. And as you indicated, that process will consider both lead time as well as the technical aspects of whether lead time, in fact, will compensate for increased safety concerns which have been raised by some. As you know, Mr. Chairman, from previous hearings we've had and conversations that you and I have had, I'm committed to resolving the safety issue before this rule is finalized. I feel like there is the potential for a net safety reduction as a result of this rule as opposed to a safety degradation, particularly if the overall rule is reviewed concerning safety on the car and our potential for capturing additional vapors with a larger canister, additionally safety at the pump and our program for a, which our proposal which will eliminate additional vapors at the pump as well as the elimination of spit back of fuel during refueling I believe there's the potential for significant safety improvement as a result of these rules it is an issue also which we want to take full comment on to see if in fact technically that is true Safety is important to you, it's important to me, it's important to the American public, and we will work together, I am sure, to ensure that we do not present a safety problem with our rulemaking. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and would be pleased to answer questions when we conclude statements from the other witnesses.
Dr. Culp, you, um, first of all, I'd like to make an observation. It is with some regret that I find that you're leaving. I am aware of the personal reasons that you find it necessary to do this, and I must observe that uh, I suspect in your own eye those are happy reasons as opposed to unhappy reasons, and of course my good wishes will go with you in that particular uh, new undertaking which is occurring. Um, do you have any comments that you'd like to make with regard to the study in addition to those made by Mr. Thomas? Uh, just a word or two of preface perhaps to uh, our study. I, I think the committee should know in view of some of the uh, media comments that have been made that uh, when I took this position, I made uh, particular emphasis uh, to the uh, people who were engaging me that this would be a purely scientific appointment, that I would have no political pressure to skew the results in one way or the other. And I can say that during the two years of this, uh, no such pressures have occurred. In fact, I would have resigned if they had occurred. I was very interested in this subject because my background in geochemistry, professor at Columbia for 20 years, and in forestry uh, gave me certain uh, scientific background for the particular subjects at hand. And so I was vitally interested in the science, and I still am. I think that uh, we knew at the outset, or I knew at the outset in taking the position that uh, whatever came out of this uh, scientific study uh, there would be controversy. If uh, we found that the uh, effects were much larger than some uh, anticipated, uh, those who would like to, to not spend any money on controls would be quite unhappy. If, in fact, uh, the results, the scientific results came out that uh, things weren't as bad as some had been saying, uh, then there's another group that's going to be unhappy. So we knew that that would happen. And we knew that the report would be attacked I'd like to submit that uh, we all uh, listen to the scientists over three to next three to six months as they have a chance to really read this report and digest it. <coughs> My preliminary information, having visited four or five university groups since the report ca came out, is that uh, in the broad spectrum of scientists, this will be very highly regarded, and uh, it'll be debated indeed in the peer-reviewed literature of science, not in the media. I'm not particularly interested in what some reporter has to say about the scientific quality of the work. I'm very interested in what uh, uh, our peers have to say about it. We went very far to obtain authors who were uh, expert in their field. We had 50 outside peer reviewers, from mainly from universities, who are experts across the whole gamut. We had over 100 well-qualified scientists within government who reviewed and participated in this report. And I think that if we were to sum up those who are truly knowledgeable in these fields, uh, a high majority of those experts in the country participated one way or another uh, in this report. And so I'm, I'm personally uh, proud of the report, and I think I speak for the numerous scientists who, who work so hard to, to, to bring it together. I think I would stop there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Dunkel, you are the witness as, as announced, and we're delighted you're here. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Frank Dunkel, Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. I do have with me uh, Mr. Richard Smith, who is the Regional Director in charge of our scientific work and research. Uh, he'll be available for technical questions if there are any, uh, if that meets with your approval. Uh, I'd like to uh, submit my prepared statement uh, to you for its incorporation in the... Without objection, your full statement will be inserted in the record and you'll be recognized for such summary as you choose. I should like then, with your permission, to summarize uh, that statement and um, if I may, I will go ahead with that summary. Uh, we're the, the report addresses the status of the North American waterfowl, uh, the decline of the black duck, and scientific findings that uh, uh, would uh, give us some thought of uh, some of the potentials in the astrication impacts 
and then some of the additional research needs. The black duck population uh, that you ask about has declined approximately 40 percent over the past 20 years in uh, eastern North America. But there are several reasons that we are detecting for that in addition to uh, any problems with uh, acidification. The uh, Harvard Har uh, Mallard harvest information uh, shows a, a vast increase uh, to 85 percent uh, in uh, the northeast area in the habitat of the black duck. It would appear that uh, there is a development of mallard black duck competition in the area, the mallard being much more aggressive than the black duck. We have been uh, focusing uh, considerable interest and research uh, with uh, Canada and ourselves uh, on the black duck problem and we are addressing that uh, both individually and collectively to see if uh, we can understand more about the decline in that population. The service funds two programs associated with uh, acid precipitation. Uh, we have a precipitation study, acid study uh, uh, mitigation program that we're following through with. We're looking at the biological effects um, of acid precipitation on the Atlantic salmon and the striped bass as well as waterfowl. In fiscal year 88, uh, the <laughs> proposed budget uh, for research is $755,000. $280,000 is for the precipitation mitigation program and $475,000 uh, to study the biological impacts. Uh, the question that you ask is, uh, one is, how has acid uh, precipitation affected the, the decline of um, uh, black duck recruitment? Uh, we believe that uh, there's some other impacts besides uh, acid uh, precipitation uh, that may be the principal reason for black duck decline, and that's uh, principal loss of habitat along the uh, northeastern coast of the United States and in the black duck uh, summer and wintering area. We have not uh, produced any scientific data that would clearly indicate that acid uh, precipitation has had a, a real impact on the decline of the black duck. Uh, we are looking at uh, several of the areas, uh, the effects of wetland loss, of hunting, and then many other factors that we think are uh, more important uh, at this point, but we are concentrating on finding what is the impact through controlled studies of the acid precipitation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this does conclude my statement. Uh, we will be uh, ready to uh, attempt to answer any questions that you or the committee might have. Thank you very much. Ms. Steed, we're delighted to recognize you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am too am pleased to be here today dis to discuss the motor vehicle safety issues that are raised by proposals to control the vapors produced by gasoline refueling. As you noted at the outset, I have brought three members of my staff for, uh, to answer technical questions. They are Barry <laughs> Fellrice, our Associate Administrator for Rulemaking, George Parker, our Associate Administrator for Enforcement, and Erica Jones, our Chief Counsel. You've asked the agency a number of questions with regard to the safety of onboard uh, vapor recovery systems. Before I answer those questions, just briefly in my testimony, I'd like to summarize the position that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is taking on this issue. And that is that it is our view that onboard vapor recovery systems proposed in the notice will add complexity to vehicle fuel systems and increase the opportunities for fuel system fires, both in crash and non-crash circumstances. In general, we believe that the inclusion of vapor recovery systems in fuel systems will increase the number of components that could possibly fail. And some modes of this kind of failure could increase the risk of fuel system fires, again, both in crash and non-crash situations. Although we believe that uh, additional complexity will present an additional risk, whatever the design of the onboard system, we also believe that this risk might be reduced if there were adequate lead time to develop onboard systems and test their safety. 
In general, however, we believe that onboard systems will not improve safety and that, in fact, they could degrade safety. We're looking forward to the public comment uh, period that Mr. Thomas talked about in his statement today, and we believe that that public comments period, uh, which will include comments we presume from vehicle manufacturers, from insurance companies, uh, and from others concerned with safety issues, will address a number of uh, EPA's proposals and concerns and address their statement that straightforward, reliable engineering solutions exist for each of the potential problems identified. Therefore, we believe that as a result of these comments, we'll have additional information to help us gauge the implications of each one of these solutions. We intend to address each one of these implications in our comments back to EPA. We're also gathering uh, additional information on alternative systems that may be available for onboard controls. I think, though, that even as we gather the information, we have to be very cautious in projecting the effectiveness of any solutions to increase safety. EPA has listed a number of several ways that it believes that proposals could improve safety. However, we are not yet convinced that a, an overall safety gain would be realized. You ask that we address the issue of the need for an automatic safety review of EPA's mobile source regulations. And you have introduced H.R. 3196, which would require the EPA administrator to consult with the Secretary of Transportation and include certain such recommendations as the Secretary may make to prevent deaths and injuries from traffic accidents. With regard to the current rulemaking underway, EPA has consulted with the Department of Transportation as required by Section 202A6 of the Clean Air Act. On the basis of EPA's statement today that it will exercise its existing authority under the Clean Air Act to solicit and respond to DOT safety-related comments on motor vehicle rulemakings, we believe that administrative improvements in our EPA's and NHTSA's relationship and coordination process could accomplish the essential purposes of your legislation, making that legislation unnecessary. And we are now working very actively with EPA to improve these procedures. As, we noted, as they noted in its uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, EPA has adjusted its proposal to a degree in response to some preliminary comments that we gave the agency. The two-year lead time provided in the draft proposal has evolved in the statement in the published notice that a lead time of at least two years may be adequate for the vast majority of not all vehicle families. However, we question whether or not the phrase at least two years differs significantly from the two-year proposal that was proposed in the draft, and whether the front-load phase-in that EPA has proposed with 70 percent of the vehicles required to conform in the first year would, in fact, permit much in the way of lead time for design and testing. We therefore remain concerned that the time allowed may not be adequate, and we intend to give very careful attention to the manufacturer's comments on this point in the rulemaking process. We also question the assurance with which EPA has found that systems can be built which, in a quote, will not adversely affect vehicle safety, unquote. The vapor recovery systems, which are capable of being implemented in the near term, would introduce, we believe, significant additional complexity into vehicle fuel systems. And we cannot say at this time that there will not be adverse safety effects from these vapor recovery systems. Now, on balance, while EPA has noted several of our technical comments, the July 22nd notice does not resolve our larger concern with the long-term consequences <coughs> of onboard recovery systems, nor does the associated technical report. We understand that EPA will consider our comments on manufacturer submissions and will issue a reproposal before taking any final actions. We essentially agree with you that the coordination process can be further improved for rulemaking, for future rulemakings on motor vehicle issues, and as I said earlier, we are actively working with EPA to that end. You've asked for our understanding of EPA's position regarding the availability of engineering solutions to the problems associated with the proposal and the resulting possible safety improvements that could be enjoyed by onboard controls. The adverse safety consequences of more Complex fuel systems are amply illustrated, we believe, by the recent Ford Ambulance case in which the fuel expul expulsion events were influenced by emissions reducing devices which tend to increase the temperature of the exhaust or to prevent the venting of fuel from the system. D despite the engineering involved in the development of such fuel systems, safety problems did arise in that case which led to the recall of the ambulances. Another factor in the Ford case was the volatility of fuel, and we note that EPA has issued a concurrent proposal to control gasoline volatility during summer months. 
We've generally concluded that the higher the re reed vapor pressure of gasoline, the greater the probability of fuel expulsion events. And we are therefore very interested in measures that would control volatility of gasoline under a variety of operating conditions, and we look forward to reviewing the comments filed on the EPA proposal. Also, we believe that regulating the maximum pumping rate at the filling station, as proposed by EPA, is needed to assure that onboard systems, if they are required by EPA, could be properly and safely designed. You also ask for our views on the safety issues that might be raised by Colorado's oxygen, oxygenated fuels program, under which vehicles would be required to operate on blends of gasoline with other fuels such as methanol or ethanol. I should say at the outset that we really don't maintain a general in-house expertise on all of the properties of various fuels. Of course, we're familiar with the vehicle safety consequences of high volatility gasoline, and we'll try to answer your question from that particular perspective. We know that the volatility of gasoline is determined by the distillation process and the type and amount of additive, additives. All things being equal, the addition of alcohol to gasoline to make oxygenated fuel will raise the RVP, make it more volatile, thereby increasing the likelihood of fuel expulsion events. We don't have the expertise in the agency to perform a detailed evaluation of specific blends, such as those that Colorado proposes to require nor do we have information to assess the practicability or cost of any possible measures to control volatility. But it is our understanding that EPA has encouraged Colorado to consider establishing controls on gasoline volatility as a means of limiting this problem. You also ask uh, about our involvement in EPA's development of heavy truck regulations for model year 1991 to 1994, particularly in regard to the safety of trap technology. And we understand that EPA will consult with the Federal Highway Administration on the implications of these regulations for the operation of heavy trucks and buses. At this point, EPA has not consulted with us on this question, but we anticipate that FHWA will coordinate its response uh, with us as part of the formal review process within the Department of Transportation on transportation-related regulations. That concludes my remarks, Mr. Chairman, and like the other members of the panel, I'll be pleased to try and answer your questions. Ms. Deed, thank you very much for a very helpful statement. The chair recognize himself for questions. The, uh, Ms. Thomas, I understand that Dr. Culp has resigned effective tomorrow. Rumors of this resignation have been around for some while. What has been done to fill this position quickly, and who will be the acting successor to Dr. Culp? Mr. Chairman, the uh, process of filling that position has begun and began, as a matter of fact, the day Dr. Culp and I sat down and discussed his resignation date because I asked Dr. Culp to assist us in uh, selecting a successor, which he has uh, agreed to do. Uh, we began both in the agencies and with Dr. Culp to begin to review uh, names of individuals that we felt were potential candidates. As you know, two years ago when we went through the selection process and chose Dr. Culp, uh, we went through a similar exercise. Uh, we will seek advice particularly, by we I mean the Joint Chairs Council would seek advice particularly from our Interagency Science Committee. For instance, Dr. Courtney Reardon from EPA, who is my representative on that committee, has been a primary source of information and recommendations to me as I've begun the process of looking at individual names. We hope we'll be able to fill that position quickly uh, with a sci scientist with the same credentials or equivalent credentials to Dr. Culp, one who we feel will be recognized as he was as a scientist among his peers capable of managing that effort. In the interim, which clearly begins immediately, we have taken action to uh, designate an individual to maintain the overall operational integrity of the NAPAP process. As you know, under the law, uh, the administrator of NOAA has the responsibility for, has the specific responsibility for designating the director of research. In consultation uh, with uh, members of the joint chairs and the uh, acting administrator of NOAA, we will appoint uh, Mrs. Jackie Schaefer, who is a, m a member of the Council of Environmental Quality, has been a member of the Joint Chairs, and has been actively involved in the ongoing efforts of NAPAP as an interim director of research. We feel it will be a very short period of time based on where we are in identifying a, a director. 
Uh, Ms. Schaefer, as you know, uh, was a regional administrator for EPA. She's well, well aware of the budget processes of government, both in that position as well as the position she holds with CEQ. She's also an excellent administrator and well aware of the ongoing processes of NAPAP. I without, feel particularly without, during without this. Without interrupting you, um, Ms. Thomas, you should know that it is the view of the chairman of this subcommittee and this committee that uh, delays in promptly filling the position uh, and events which would threaten the continuity and the vigor of this inquiry would be not only unwise, but very much inconsistent with the public interest. You and I share the exact same view on that, and we're in the process of ensuring that there are no problems as far as continuity is concerned. Ms. Thomas, uh, in your August 20, 1987 reply, which is Exhibit B to the subcommittee's uh, GAO report on NAPAP, you called it constructive and said that the joint chairs approved Dr. Culp's request for increased staffing. You said that two of these positions are still open. You said that on June 29, the joint chairs asked Dr. Culp for a description of the 1990 assessment and the process for its development. You then said, with this information in hand, the joint chairs will see to it that the director of research has positions and resources sufficient to complete the research program and to prepare the assessment. Now, Dr. Culp, you first sought six or seven scientist positions in 1985. The joint chairs approved two positions for fiscal 1987. Those remained unfilled as of last December. Have they been filled as of this time? And has the June 1987 approval by the joint chairs for a total of four scientists been realized uh, in terms of personnel on site and at work? Uh, no, not in exactly that form. As we got into the late uh, spring and early summer in an attempt to complete the interim assessment, we realized it was not going to be possible to uh, hire the quality of people we needed in a short time. So rather than uh, go forward with those positions empty, uh, what we did was to contract through the agencies for expertise to uh, assist us, both in the preparation of the interim report and in the planning of the research for 8889. I'm curious, I'm curious how effective that will be. It strikes me that you asked for, uh, in the biblical terms, bread, and they gave you a rock. Um, Mr. Thomas, it is now late in 1987. Matter of fact, we have now entered fiscal year 1988. There is uh, only a little more than three years remaining in the program. Can you explain why this long delay in hiring needed scientists? Well, actually, Mr. Chairman, I think that the, that the uh, scientists uh, required, particularly uh, through the agencies, the mechanism of working through the agencies, uh, has been a process that has assured that, that the scientific talents needed was there. One of the problems we have had, and it was evidenced, I think, uh, when uh, Dr. Culp first moved to try to strengthen the director of research's office, was uh, uh, attracting people to those positions, setting the positions up, the bureaucratic mechanisms required. Before, before two years ago, before 85, the assessment staff was actually a part of EPA as opposed to a part of NAPAP. So we've gone through a transition. We're actually moving, I think, in a direction which will ensure that now we have a balance between people in the agencies and in director of research. Mr. Office. Thomas, how does this jibe with the fact that uh, approvals were given for the acquisition of a number of scientists who were not, who were not retained? What it says is that you were unable to carry forward the agreed upon expansion of staff. Well, I think Dr. Culp can give you a review of why, from an administrative point of view and otherwise, it was difficult to fill those positions over that period of time. Chair, the chair observes, is regretted, that I do not find that to be adequate. Mr. Peach, do you have a comment on this, and can you further elaborate on what management changes you believe are needed to prevent delays and to ensure uh, adequate, proper, and uh, truthful completion of the NAPAP program, ending up with a final report that the Congress can use to deal with legislative business relative to acid rain? Oh. Yes, Mr. 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 Chairman, as we look at the process, first, uh, the NAPAP process can be viewed in some respects as a cumbersome type process because it is an interagency process with joint chairs, and so that makes the, the organizational mechanism a difficult one to work with. Especially this director they hired of the number of people they said they needed, nor have they hired the number that were approved. 
Uh, that's, uh, that's correct. One of the things that we pointed to directly with respect to the director of research position is when you establish this position for someone as director of research, but also a job of being the principal spokesperson, spokesperson, overall management responsibilities for a lot of things that are occurring, including it would be looking at hiring these positions and other things, that perhaps they may need someone that also is a position of a deputy director for assessments. In other words, someone that could concentrate directly all their energies on the assessment uh, preparation and development, and uh, perhaps free the director of research to concentrate on the overall management of the process. Uh, we think that that in part is one of the things that led to the delay as the director of uh, research uh, tended to try to involve himself deeply in the development of the assessment at the same time as there were many other responsibilities that were also requiring part of his time and effort. Um, Mr. Thomas and Dr. Culp, uh, there have been reports in the media that the four volume interim assessment issued last week ignored studies inconsistent with the administration's acid rain position, that the study selectively quoted from others and accepted unrealistic projections about future emissions in order to show that acid rain problems will disappear. I would observe that each of the four volumes make reference to many studies. Much of the criticism I detect is centered on the executive summary. Dr. Gene Likens is one of the major critics. The Canadian Minister of Environment is another. It is also noted that uh, NAPAP's Associate Director of Research, Dr. Paul Ringgold, who is, I gather, here today at the committee's request, threatened to resign uh, and that he was critical of the report, although he told our staff that he had made no such threat and felt the report was balanced but was critical of the process. How do each of you gentlemen respond to these criticisms? Chairman, as I indicated in my statement, I think the, the, both the study volumes, uh, the, the assessment volumes, as well as the executive summary themselves are a good document and documents that speak for themselves. In any summary, you have to extract from a wide range of conclusions. We felt the major conclusions, the major ones, uh, were extracted and incorporated into the executive summary. As far as the, the, the other issues, why don't I ask Dr. Culp to comment specifically on some of those. Yes, I'd like to, to first uh, discuss the matter of the uh, quality of the science and what we have done with that. Uh, the, I would challenge uh, any of our critics that we have omitted significant peer-reviewed literature. We went to, to great pains to include every significant scientific report that we, could, we were aware of in this study. We are also contacting those few scientists that are quoted widely in the media, perhaps incorrectly sometimes, but their, their quotations suggest a certain unawareness of the data in the other three volumes. And we are asking them for references or for additional data, which we certainly would factor into the 1990 report. We're very anxious to get any criticism that is valid or any new information. And we are not only open to that, we, we solicit it and we're going to solicit it uh, from them. I think so far as the, uh, the operation is concerned, uh, Dr. Ringgold uh, uh, never resigned uh, to me that I know of. And uh, you may want to ask him what he thinks about it. But uh, uh, we've worked as a team for two years in attempting to, uh, to get this uh, a massive effort through. Uh, I think one, one other note uh, regarding to something that Mr. Peach said, that uh, I don't personally share the notion in the future that uh, you should have a, a deputy a, a director for assessment. You may need a deputy director to take more of the administrative load, but your chief scientist has to be the responsible person for the quality of that report and has to give the leadership to it. It cannot be delegated. That's what the whole position is about. Just one more question, then I'm going to, going to yield to other members of the subcommittee. Mr. Thomas, the publication Inside EPA makes this statement, and I quote, a source privy to NAPAP affairs says Culp was responsible for penning an executive summary which EPA sources regard as a political document, quote, not supported by the backup data. 
Do you and Mr. Culp, or rather, do you and Dr. Culp wish to comment on that? And if so, how? Well, the executive summary was actually uh, completed with the participation of numerous individuals. I, for one, participated in lengthy sessions uh, concerning review of conclusions in the executive summary, as did other members of the joint chair. Uh, I recall conference phone calls uh, uh, whereupon we reviewed and discussed those conclusions. I recall one lengthy session, I think was about seven hours, that I participated in in reviewing general conclusions. Uh, and the scientists from each of the agencies uh, on the Interagency Science Committee participated in those processes as well. So to try to say that the executive summary was the work of an individual is just wrong. It was, it was uh, extensive work uh, uh, by uh, numerous individuals, particularly in the final review stages as we brought that uh, whole report together. I'd like to add to that that the, <coughs> the, the uh, senior scientists of each of the agencies who comprise the Interagency Science Committee. Uh, we worked together for, I would guess, a total of 20 days uh, where we were attempting to debate, discuss, and finally uh, hammer out a consensus of what the best science said and to make certain that what was in the executive summary, and that was a joint effort of all of us, that what was in the executive summary accurately reflected what was in the conclusions of the chapters. A great deal of that time was to make sure that they were consistent. Very well. Chair notes that the chair has utilized um, 14 minutes. The chair will recognize members of the subcommittee for that same period. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Waldron, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I can certainly appreciate that, that uh, you would uh, Speaking particularly of Dr. Culp, be uh, uh, concerned that this uh, report be bandied about politically and and uh, people drawing different conclusions, and we all know that's going to happen, and uh, that does not go to the underlying scientific uh, basis of the report. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, we are a political uh, system, and we are all reaching for some kind of scientific foundation for uh, our judgments and and certainly uh, you would expect as well that uh, 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 this report uh, would be the foundation of attitudes that are formed uh, uh, one way or the other. And in that light, uh, uh, does the summary in focusing on citing percentages of lakes uh, with less than five uh, pH, uh, doesn't that tend to understate the, the concern that perhaps we should have uh, for the acidic state of lakes in our country in as much as, as I understand it, pHs uh, greater than five are cause for real concern? Would that not be a fair statement? I think the um, important thing to note there is that the pH of 5.0 uh, is the acidity where the health of fish populations changes rapidly for the worse. In our uh, chapter 8, we have a figure that shows the probability of a healthy fish population as a function of pH. And at a pH of 6.0, the probability is higher than 98% of finding healthy fish populations in the Northeast. At a pH of 5.5, it is about 80%, 85%, and at 5.0, it is 60%. And then when you go down to 4.5 pH, it is 20%. So the curve drops very quickly through that 5.0. That's, that's one reason. The second reason for using uh, the 5.0 is that is about the pH where the neutralizing capacity is about zero. That's where the, where the watershed in the lake uh, neutralizing capacity essentially uh, stops. And uh, in the chapter itself, we're very careful to provide all the data of the number of lakes and the area of the lakes that have a pH less than 6.0, less than 5.5, and less than 5.0. So all of the data is, is present. And in the executive summary, we also reference the fact 
that uh, there are very few uh, uh, cases below 5.5 where you have a major uh, problem with the fish. And uh, I, I think these give some of the reasons for mm -hmm. this. Let me ask you selection. what you mean by uh, the, the uh, uh, natural neutralizing process stopping at 5.0. Oh. Well, it goes through zero there. It's positive above about 5, and below that it is, it is negative. In other words, there is no a further neutralizing capacity in uh -huh. the waters. Which means to say that if, if it's above 5.0, uh, uh, you've got an extra agent working for you uh, to, uh, to help you counteract the effects of uh, any additional acidic precipitation. Th that's right. But above 5, you do have some effect, both on the fish, and as you approach 6, you still have some effect on simple biological life. You see, in, in nature, uh, the water surface waters range from a pH of about 3 to a pH greater than 9. And there's living, viable biota in all of those waters. It just changes. The species composition changes from point to point along that curve. But we were focusing primarily on the effect of sports fish. But there is change for every tenth of a pH unit from 3 to 9. Uh, what can be said from this report about the, the, uh, uh, the effect on the neutralizing agent? Uh, uh, as I understand that if a lake were moving from, let's say, 6 down through 5.5 and, and on down, I gather, to 5.0, uh, you would uh, uh, have a more gradual movement as the buffering capacity is used up, but as you, as you got down into the, the uh, 5 range, you're going to move much more rapidly. Uh, can you tell us anything about the concern that we ought to have for the impact of present uh, anticipated deposition over the next 10 years on the ability of, uh, or, or the state of that uh, uh, neutralizing factor that may be present. Uh, yes, uh, our research is pointing very strongly uh, to the fact that over the next decade or two, or possibly even more than that, that at present levels of deposition, there will be very few lakes that will change in their present condition of acidity or neutralizing capacity. How about However, change of, do you mean change of one more tenth of one? Yes, some, one something like something like that. Uh, put it in terms of neutralizing capacity, whereas uh, the steep part of the curve goes from about, uh, say, from zero to 100 microequivalents per liter. Uh, it, it, it'll change less probably than about 20 of those units over decades at present levels of deposition. Now, this is for the, the general case. There are special cases where that is not true. But in general, that's what we expect would be essentially no abrupt changes if deposition continues at present levels over the next few decades. If you had a uh, uh, water that was, say, 5.3, yes. uh, you would expect over 10 years uh, a change of what degree? 0.02. And so you would then be at uh, 5.28. Yes. Is that right? Can you tell me about this steady state theory that uh, yes, uh, I'd be glad to, you uh, seem to have used as an assumption uh, in, in the Well, it's really not an assumption. It was earlier a theory, and then a great deal of data in the last 10 years has supported the fact that in the glaciated areas of the Northeast, and indeed in Canada, that most of these lakes are in steady state. Let me attempt to illustrate this for you. Imagine two cases. Imagine a granite bathtub on one side and on the other side, imagine a field full of limestone. Uh, in the granite bathtub case, whatever the pH of the rain is will fall into that bathtub, and the pH of the water in the bathtub will be the same as the rain. So if the rain is acid, the water there is going to be the same. This is the case for glaci uh, glaciated lakes at high altitude. Uh, many parts of the glaciated terrain where, where soils are very thin or almost absent. So you have almost no neutralizing capacity. The rain comes down, falls in on that rock surface, runs into the lake, and so it's very But those are really not of concern to us in this because they're already gone. Uh, I, and I so to say that they will not change is really not very helpful. 
Well, only that I want, I want to illustrate the extremes, and then we'll, we'll go to the cases in the middle. In the case of, uh, let's say, the limestone uh, soil, uh, high carbonate uh, minerals, uh, this essentially gives you infinite uh, uh, neutralizing capacity, and that's the case for most of the soil across the United States. Now, the cases we're interested in, indeed, are between those two categories. And as the, uh, in, the, in, the in the more average case, uh, the acidified rain moves through the soils, it reacts partly, and then moves on out into the surface water. Now, in most cases, in the glaciated areas, for most kinds of mineralogy, it's a matter of only a few years, we believe, until that equilibrates, at most maybe a decade or so, until what is washing through year after year uh, comes out about the same, because you've equilibrated with the, the reactivity of the minerals in that soil uh, situation. If on the other hand you have a very deep soil where you have certain reactivities so that you can absorb sulfate such as you have in the southeast over a long period of time, then there may be a very slow change and you will not have reached steady state. But in the glaciated areas it appears that we have. Now the acid rain that's been falling on the northeast has been doing so for at least 50 years. The emissions uh, 1930 of SO2 in the eastern United States were essentially the same as they are today. There have been ups and downs uh, during that period, but you've had a very uh, significant amount of acidification during that, so that most of these lakes have probably been acidified for decades in this area. And we don't expect significant change in most of them in the near term. Now, obviously, if acidification of rain were to go up, if we were to put more emissions in the air and acidification were to go up, then these granite bathtubs and their near cousins would very quickly adjust and be more acid, and therefore you would have a change in the life in those lakes. Um, the, um, what can you tell me about the, what I gather is not part of your testimony or, or your focus, but that of Mr. Thomas. As I understand Mr. Thomas's testimony, we go through certain bullets, which are the findings, and then there are several paragraphs of conclusions that, uh, that, that are conclusions from the findings. And uh, in the conclusions from the findings, we are saying that uh, uh, there is a risk that we are underestimating the extent or possible future environmental damage from acid rain. And depending on the weight we give that risk, uh, we, we would either uh, believe we should act now or that we have uh, uh, time to wait. Uh, the previous assessments, as I understand it, uh, that the, of a board uh, that the President had appointed, and I thought it was the National Academy of Sciences Board or the like, said that, and I think their conclusion was something to the effect that the risks of not doing something uh, and the possibility of substantial environmental damage outweighed the risk of doing something now, incurring costs now, uh, and, uh, uh, and perhaps those costs not uh, uh, um, uh, being the best investment of the effort. Uh, now, uh, we are apparently coming to a different conclusion. Do you feel that your report uh, uh, is at odds with that previous conclusion of the uh, uh, President's uh, uh, board? I'm not sure that they exactly concluded that, but that is getting over into the policy area, uh, and it's, it's not for me to comment on that really. I think that what our report does is provide you, the decision makers, with a great deal more information than you had before. We've reduced the, the number of uncertainties. For example, in the 1970s, it was widely, there was wide concern that acid rain would negatively affect the productivity of agricultural crops. We now know that isn't true. At ambient levels of, of acid rain, there is no detectable <coughs> effect on agricultural crops. So that's one uncertainty that's been put to bed. In the case of forests, uh, there is still concern. We have 
done enough experiments now, I believe, to show that in the case of forests, uh, at least seedlings are not affected by ambient levels of acid rain. On the mountaintop above cloud base, where we have a lot of severe stresses, we still are not certain what role acid rain is playing, and so there is a risk that indeed in, uh, it, it may have a significant effect in damaging those high altitude forests. In the next three years, we hope to solve that problem. So that I think as we go forward, certain things are now known and certain are unknown. In, in the aquatics area, just to, to add one yeah. other thing, what we're trying to do here is to determine what is the present status of lakes across the whole United States and what is the status of the streams. We need to know what fraction of them uh, are acid, what fraction of them uh, are harming fish. That gives us a baseline and then we need to be able to have enough scientific understanding to predict that if uh, a deposition goes up or down, what will happen out there in the future. I have my one more question, Mr. Chairman. In these uncertainties that uh, have been resolved, one of them is, as I understand it, that sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are uh, major precursors of acid rain. Yes. Uh, and you and your summary here or the testimony uh, uh, state that uh, they, along with volatile organic compounds, are uh, the, the, uh, the ones that we now cite as the causes. Uh, what's the, the distribution uh, I in terms of acidic uh, rain uh, between sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides as on the one hand and volatile organic compounds on the other? Well, the sulfur dioxide or the sulfuric acid is the dominant acid that comes down making up the acid rain over the eastern United States. The volatile organic compounds are important because in the presence of sunlight, you, you produce hydrogen peroxide from them. The hydrogen peroxide in the cloud reacting with sulfur dioxide is what produces the uh, acid rain. Can you give a percentage on those contributions? That's my interest. Uh, well, in, in the Northeast, uh, I would say the uh, sulfuric to nitric acid ratio is in the vicinity of two to three in favor of uh, the sulfuric acid. I see. And so the volatile organics are about one third. Well, they're an agent. They're an agent that helps convert the sulfur dioxide uh -huh. to sulfuric acid. They're, they don't produce acids themselves. They are they be produce oxidants, which then produce the acids. I understand. Thank you very much. Time Mr. the Chairman. gentleman has expired. Chair recognizes now the gentleman from Kansas. Chair advises that the chair is recognizing members for 14 minutes. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Culp, I, I am concerned or, or just have some questions about um, some assumptions that were made in, in the report that we are discussing today. And it is, it is my understanding that, that in your report, you assume that if, that if acidic deposition remains at about its present level, then the acidification of lakes in this country would, would not be uh, significantly uh, uh, changed. changed. Mm -hmm. My, my question is, do you, do you anticipate and did you assume that acidic deposition is going to increase? No, that assumption was, b uh, that conclusion was based on continuing emissions at the present rate. At the present rate. At the present rate. But in the report you, you assume on page 117, or I-17 I guess it is, that in fact between 1980 and 1990 the level of acidic deposition remains constant. However, between 1990 and sometime after the turn of the century, you're projecting that acidic deposition is going to, to increase. And I'm just questioning whether with, the, with your point that the acidification of lakes is not going to, to uh, change significantly, did you assume in making that statement that acidic deposition will, will continue at present levels, which you uh, just indicated, or did you assume that it's going to increase as your report assumes? The assumption on what would happen to the lakes was purely that emissions would continue at the present level. But let me go beyond that. And, pay, and figure 117 that you're referring to, we pu are putting there some scenarios, some what-if questions that might happen in the future. And the top one, which we call a base case, is essentially level out to about 2010, and then it drops down as old plants are re uh, replaced by new plants. We have other curves there that show the 
uh, emissions going down fairly steeply if uh, there is implementation of emerging technology over this period of time. Mm -hmm. So what is, we are not trying to predict what will happen in the future here because we don't know. What we're trying to do is to, to give you uh, a range of scenarios of what would happen if certain things develop in a certain way. Okay, but in the arriving at your conclusion that the acidification level. of the lakes in this country uh, will not uh, worsen over the next uh, 10, 15 years, you have assumed that the acidic depositions maintain, will be maintained at the current level when in fact your report recognizes that they are going to increase. No, the report uh, in this one scenario suggests that under certain assumptions it might increase. I personally think these are rather improbable, but we have to give a series of scenarios. The, the base case you have here assumes, for example, no natural gas will be used at any time in the future. It assumes that the technology for emission control is that of the 1960s or early 1970s, that we will have no inc improvement in technology over the next 50 years. It also assumes there will be no repowering, such as fluidized bed, when, when older un uncontrolled units are life extended. This particular base case uh, in that sense is very conservative. However, the base case you have here is assumes an average 50 years of life of the old units before they're abandoned, and that, that could be low, in which case the curve would be a bit higher. So there are all those factors involved. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying then is, is that, that you don't accept the base case in, 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 the, in, in the study. You're saying that as far as you're concerned, the base case is too conservative in terms of measuring the progress that's going to be made in controlling acidic deposition. I, I'd rather say that the, we, we constructed these various cases uh, so that you could see what would happen if certain things occur. And the base case, again, says that there will be no improvement in technology, there will be no uh, uh, use, for example, of natural gas. because. This base case goes back about five years or so. A lot of different groups mm -hmm. have made this as sort of a base case, but uh, conditions are changing. Five years ago, uh, we didn't have in front of us uh, some of these new <coughs> emerging technologies which can be very effective in the long okay. term. Let, just so I really understand the point that you're trying to make in, 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 in concluding that acidic deposition is not going to significantly increase and thereby damage the lakes in this country. You're you're assuming that acidic deposition is going to continue at a constant level that we're currently experiencing. Is that yeah. correct? Yes and no. To predict what's going to happen to the lakes, the assumption we made is that, con that emissions will continue at the present level. How we long? are not predicting what those emissions are going to do in the future. We're rather giving you scenarios of what could happen depending on uh, the implementation of technology. Okay, so, so you're assuming that these, the, the present rate will continue indefinitely? Is that what you're assuming? For that particular uh, calculation, yes. Okay. Um, the other, the other uh, line of questioning that I wanted to pursue a little bit wi was with respect to our relations with Canada and where the Canadians are in this area. Um, Ambassador um, Gottlieb has, has stated that emission standards for heavy duty vehicles uh, uh, will be effective in December 1988. And I'm just curious, until now has, has Canada had NOx controls as stringent as the U.S. on motor vehicles? Mr. Mr. Thomas? Slattery, I'd be glad to submit for the record, if you'd like, a comparative table of standards uh, in Canada and the United States for automobiles and trucks. Basically, uh, Canada has, in the last two years, adopted standards both for cars and trucks for pollutants that are uh, equivalent or the same as uh, standards in the United States. I'm trying to look at exactly are those effective now, Mr. Thomas. Some, no, some of them. Are, well, some of them are, and some of them are being phased mm -hmm. in. I think that I'd say they're probably a year or two behind, maybe as far as phasing all of them in. But basically, they're 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 aiming towards an equivalent program. As far as heavy-duty trucks are concerned. I do not believe Canada has adopted a heavy-duty truck mm -hmm. NOx standard that is equivalent to the United States. Ha have the Canadians taken steps to require in any area of motor vehicles that their vehicles 
uh, have greater controls than, than any vehicles in this country? In other words, are they going beyond us in terms of trying to uh, uh, restrict NOx emissions from their, their auto fleet? No, they have not. To my knowledge, they have not, unless they have something under works now that I don't know of. Is it safe to say that in the last, say, five years, that the Canadians have lagged behind us in terms of NOx control on vehicles? Well, but controls generally on mobile, mobile sources in Canada have been behind the United States. Yeah. Would, would the gentleman yield? Be happy to yield. As a matter of fact, this year, the Canadians got to standards that were adopted by the United States in 1981. Is that not so, Mr. Thomas? Uh, in, for instance, automobiles. That's model year 81. It, uh, that uh, model year 88 in Canada is comparative to model year 81 in the United States. For so they, they haven't yet marketed cars that are equal in terms of emissions to those that are marketed in the United States this year. Is that not so? That's correct. And and and. For the record, would you submit the difference between those 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 standards so that so that we they show in the record? Yes. The other the other the other concern is that that given this lateness on the part of the Canadian, if automobile emissions are a constituent of acid rain, they will be approximately seven years or eight years behind us, but before their fleets clean up, will be it is complete to uh, have all cars functioning on, on USA 81 standards, they will not do it until 1998 or very close to the turn of the century. Is that not so? That's correct. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, I was happy to yield. Um, I'm just curious, do you agree with, with Ambassador uh, Gottlieb that, uh, that many of the, the precursor emissions allegedly damaging Canada uh, originate in the U.S.? Uh, two things about that. First, uh, from about the peaks of both countries, the peak SO2 emissions in the early 70s till about 1980, uh, the SO2 emissions came down by 30 to 40 percent in both countries by our mutual efforts, Clean Air Act and the things that they Between did. Between what years? The about Culp? 71, 72 and 1980. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very important as you look toward the future, they have a plan, as you know, to uh, take 35% out between 1980 and 1995, something like that. They say they, say they propose to take out 50%. In but then the right five. calculation shows 35. Now, if the, gentleman would, if the gentleman would continue to yield, though, they use and allow the use in Canada of what we prohibit, and that is the, quote, intermittent controls. Is that not so? That's, that's correct. Ms. Thomas? So they, they do allow intermittent controls, which we don't allow. They allow tall stacks. Uh, they allow a variety. It's a different program. It's a very different program than ours in certain respects. Now, now, now tall stacks have the practical effect of assuring that if you're going to produce acid rain, you're going to get the, you're going to get the emissions up the level where the where the high winds can carry it a long way and assure that you have acid dep deposition some distance away. Is that not so? That's correct, but as they've come back, I must say, with their acid rain program, it is, it is those smelters that they're now looking at reducing emissions from, so it would reduce the long-range loading. Now, I'm, I'm not going to take this time away from the gentleman. I'm going to, going to see to it he's fairly <laughs> safe on his time. I appreciate that, Mr. I Chairman. I just want to observe, in addition to that, intermittent controls uh, have the practical effect of giving credit for the time when a facility is shut down because the, the product does not happen to be marketable or because there's a labor stoppage or because there is some other reason that causes a shutdown of the facility. Is that not so? That, that is correct. And that's so uh, things like acts of God, strikes, uh, and uh, inability to market the product that is produced by the particular facility uh, is credited as, as an air pollution control activity up in Canada, is it not? That is correct. Remarkable definition of air pollution control. I thank the gentleman for yielding. <laughs> Mr. Sire, if I could just finish well, that 35%. Yes, I did want to get an answer to my, to my question about, um, about the source of the Canadian problem. I, is it in this country or not, Dr. Culp? But just a preface, and uh, if I could, and I'll answer it. But they are proposing 35% between 19... 80 and say 1995. It's important to realize that in our they are proposing, you say they are proposing to mm -hmm. do that. Now, whether they will achieve it, of course, is a question. Uh, in the 11 border states, the U.S. 
bordering on Canada, we have reduced the emissions by 10 percent from 1980 until today. Now, what will happen in the next 10 years, we don't know for sure, but that is a fair part of the 35 percent. Now, the question is, uh, how much of the U.S. emissions, uh, what percentage of the U.S. emissions are contributing, uh, sorry, let me back up, what percent of the acidity in the rain in Canada is due to emissions in the United States? And there's a large difference among scientists on this. The official Canadian position has been that we're contributing half in 1980. Things have changed a lot since 1980, and I think our atmospheric scientists would not necessarily agree that we know that that ratio is correct. We also have some evidence in the western part of, uh, the southwestern part of, uh, of the Adirondacks that a fair part of some of that uh, pollution is, in fact, coming from the uh, uh, Toronto Metropolitan Complex. So it's, it's, it's not very well known right now. Mm -hmm. As but to who is doing what to whom? Is is it your conclusion then that that we're causing fifty less than fifty percent of the problem? I'm saying we don't know. It's okay. it's not so obvious as uh, has been stated. It may be less than fifty percent now. Yeah, I think that you have probably already been asked this question or one similar to it, but I wasn't here to, uh, to hear your response. And I, I'm just curious. Uh, in the September 19th, 87 edition of, of the Washington Post, there's a UPI story quoting um, Canada's environment minister, uh, Mr. McMillan, as denouncing the NAPAP report that we're discussing as not being a scientific exercise. And he used some rather strong terms. I think one of them, he, one term he uh, used was he called it voodoo science, and he also called it political propaganda. Uh, and he says this information is highly selective and incomplete. Um, perhaps you've had an opportunity to respond to that uh, rather critical analysis of this report, and I'm just uh, curious uh, what your uh, reaction to that assessment is. Um, Mr. Thomas? Yes. It's unfortunate that uh, Mr. McMillan made those comments. I believe he made them before he had an opportunity to read the report. Um, well, and I have had an opportunity to meet with Mr. McMillan. I, well, I, I know that you've m spent some time with him this week. At least that's what I've been told. Yes. And, and um, we, we hope to have and will have, I believe, shortly an opportunity for our scientists and Canadian scientists to sit and discuss the science of the report, which is exactly the forum I think we need in order to discuss the scientific issues. We feel very confident in that report. We feel it's a, it's a uh, body of scientific information that can't be matched as far as the world is concerned, and we want to share and participate actively with Canadian scientists as we, as we have done in this program actively for the last number of years. What evidence do you have, Mr. Thomas, that, uh, that Mr. McMillan didn't have an opportunity to, to uh, read the report before he commented about the report? He made the, rec the quote before the report was released. Would, would, are would, you, would, would, are would, you would jump certain, you? Mr. Thomas, that that is the case? I mean, d did he have access to the report any other way? Or can you say with certainty that, that this report was, was not available to Mr. McMillan at the time that he, that he uh, made these, these comments? Uh, I, there was, as, as you may recall, uh, I believe a leaked version of an early draft of the executive summary, uh, which uh, may possibly have been the source of Mr. McMillan's uh, uh, review. Uh, obviously, that wasn't the, the body of the report, nor was it the final version of the executive summary. He could possibly have had that. Dr. Culp may have more information on that question. Yeah, I'd like to add to that because we have about 20 joint projects that have been ongoing with the Canadian scientists, and our scientists and their scientists are much more in agreement than some other uh, people involved. And um, the important thing is that in February, we had a joint scientific report to the bilateral right. advisory consultative group between the two countries where the two scientific groups uh, right. put together this formal report. Mm -hmm. And 75 percent at least of the conclusions in that agreed upon joint American-Canadian report are directly in uh, this interim assessment. I mean, there's no contradiction between what their sure. scientists agreed to in February and what is in this report. And the, the other 25 percent represents new information that was not considered at that time. Finally, I'd just like to note that one of the critics of the report on just one small part of the report is uh, Environment Canada's uh, Dr. Schindler, uh, who we've worked with for many years, and 
he said this is an absolutely first class piece of work. Who, who said that? Dr. Schindler. And who is he again, Mr. He, he is uh, one of the uh, top biological sciences, scientists in environment in Canada. Now, he criticized our use of the 5.0, and that, that's another sort of second order question, but he recognized that it was an outstanding piece of work. And I haven't heard any reputable Canadian scientists say that this is flawed from a scientific point of view. Yeah. Well, in fairness to, to Mr. McMillan, I mean, as we sit here, we don't know for sure whether he, he uh, read a preliminary report, and uh, there's probably not really m many significant differences between the preliminary report and the final report, is there? The Mr. big Tom? difference between just having the executive summary or having been briefed on the executive summary and reading the full report of 10 chapters. Okay. Uh, if, the, if the chair would indulge me for one last question. Um, the report states that there may be a net benefit of approximately $100 million dollars from the uh, deposition of nitrogen on agricultural soils. Um, can you expand upon this? Yes, uh, all virtually all agricultural soils and indeed all forest land is deficient in nitrogen. And of course the farmer puts on uh, nitrate uh, fertilizer and in the, uh, in the forest, uh, the forest product industry when they're attempting to maximize growth in plantations uh, will always uh, add uh, nitrogen fertilization. How was, how was this figure arrived at? And I'm just curious, uh, you know, what farmers are going to benefit from this? And well, uh, if you, uh, uh, we, we expect that in 1990, as we do much more work with the economics, that this will be greatly refined, and this is a very conservative estimate, but it was based on the idea that uh, the farmer puts a certain amount of nitrogen on his uh, field, and if he's real smart, or he has a proper agent, uh, each year it's decided how much he ought to put on because of the analysis of the soil. And of course, if you're getting some of it free from the atmosphere, uh, then that's a benefit he has to put on a little bit less than he would otherwise. Well, would the gentleman, yes. the gentleman yield? Yeah, be happy to yield. When I was a little boy, my granddad used to run a farm in Iowa. And he called lightning and snow the poor man's fertilizer because they fixed nitrogen in the high atmosphere and the snow brought it down. And that 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 uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere enriches the soil is not new knowledge at all, as a gentleman who comes from Kansas understands. Yeah, no question about that. I was just curious about how you would quantify a hundred million dollars, and 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 beyond that, I was just curious as to how you would identify who was going to benefit from this. Are, are we primarily talking about? about farmers in the northeastern part of the country? Or it was across, essentially across the eastern part of the U.S. because that's where most of the nitrate from massive rain is coming down. And mm -hmm. it was simply saying, you're going to increment this many more tons uh, per hectare uh, or pounds yeah. per hectare of nitrogen, and that's worth so much if you buy it as fertilizer. Yeah. Okay. I know that my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. The time the gentleman has expired. Well, the chair is going to recognize the gentleman for another round. Um, gentlemen, volume four of the interim assessment at pages eight to ten states that the term, quote, sensitivity, close quote, of waters has often been misused in the literature on acid rain and that low ANC is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a lake to be called sensitive. Many other studies use this term rather liberally. Dr. Culp. How has this term been used or misused, and what should be the proper understanding of the term? Uh, sensitivity has normally been used to indicate the rate at which a watershed or a lake would change its acidity uh, as a result of change in deposition. And in a very crude way, this is a good first approximation, so that if uh, in fact, in, in, in Chapter 8, one of, the ta one of the figures here, I think it's 8-25, uh, eight, uh, eight uh, uh, no, excuse me. Anyway, um, the, uh, there's a fairly flat part of the curve where the uh, neutralizing capacity uh, <coughs> is such is large enough so that the pH is not affected uh, as you move up along that curve. But then as you get down toward very small amounts of the neutralizing capacity, 
and then the acidity can change. So you say that's the area of sensitivity. The reason we say that uh, uh, the sensitivity, uh, the ANC, is a necessary but not sufficient condition is that uh, in addition to the neutralizing capacity of the minerals in the water, uh, when you get into the lake, you can actually have other things going on, such as the reduction of, of uh, sulfate in the bottom of the lake from organisms, and this in turn reduces the acidity. So that you have to know other things about the watershed beside only the uh, uh, amount of uh, acidity, uh, <laughs> of uh, neutralizing capacity. Doctor, let me turn now to a criticism which I'm rather frequently hearing, particularly with regard to the sensitivity problems in the southeast. The criticism is made that the report does not give sufficient concern to this problem. How do you answer those criticisms? Well, in the southeast, uh, as we indicated earlier, we have thick soils that are full, that have a high concentration of aluminum and iron oxides, and these absorb and are absorbing sulfate. While they're absorbing the sulfate, they are preventing acidification. If they become saturated at some time in the future, uh, then uh, the waters that emerge from these soils will be more acid. And this is treated fully in chapter uh, eight. Now, gentlemen, some critics of the NAPAP report question why the report does not address the impact of emissions in Canada as well as the United States. I note that volume three of the report makes the statement that about 30 to 35 percent of the man-made sulfur emitted in the eastern United States exits to the western Atlantic. The report goes on to say, Bermuda, for example, concentrations of hydrogen ions, sulfur, nitrogen compounds, and organic acids in the precipitation in storms originating from the eastern United States and Canada are about three times greater than concentrations in storms from other parts of the Atlantic Ocean. Supported by precipitation chemistry measures, measurements taken aboard ships, the calculations suggest that approximately three million metric tons of sulfur exported from North America to the Atlantic annually about half deposits to the western Atlantic, while the other half is deposited further to the east. Of the about one million metric tons of exported nitrogen, most is deposited to the western Atlantic. Aircraft measurements confirm that a significant amount of sulfur transport takes place in the upper atmosphere. Does the assessment discuss impacts of emissions on Canada? And if not, why not? It does not uh, uh, discuss the impact on Canada. Uh, I guess uh, we decided that we should restrict the impact on resources to the United States because we did not have peer-reviewed published literature that would enable us to do that in terms of Canada. They have not done, for example, the rigorous statistical sampling of the lakes that we have done, so we don't have a direct comparability to our data in theirs. And as I indicated earlier, uh, our atmospheric scientists uh, feel that there's some very large uncertainties in, in the net that flow to Canada. How do we get a definitive discussion of air pollution in the United States and Canada? Who pollutes who? Uh, to what amount? With what? Without having that matter addressed? I think that's right, and we have a fairly uh, large part of the NAPAP budget over the next three years devoted to the development of a regional acid deposition model that should enable us to make such predictions in the future. So you're saying, are you telling us then that you were going to address the question of U.S. Uh, pollution of Canada with uh, different uh, I think uh, by constituents yes, of acid rain? I think by 1990, uh, with the development of this model and its verification, and we're going to spend quite a bit of money in the next two years and checking and verifying this model, uh, we would then, and we have Canadians involved in this uh, verification process, that then uh, we would hope to be able to make a much more quantitative statement about uh, what is moving from where to where. So you're saying that the study will now move to consideration of uh, acid deposition from the United States in, in Canada? We will be able to talk about impacts over all of North America when this model is completed. 
you intend then to include that in the study? Yes. I have to tell you, I don't think that a study that does not include that, when it's finally completed, is going to give us a fair and an adequate picture and a basis upon which this country may properly deal with the, with the policy issues here. Will this, also, will this study also begin to include information as to Canadian pollution of the United States and trans-border uh, carriage of pollutants from Canada to the United States? This model will allow us to do both, yes. And you're giving us the commitment now, I assume, Mr. Thomas, you're associating yourself with that, that this, that this commitment will, rather, that, that you will include in the study in the future not only impacts of U.S. pollution af affecting Canada, but, but also of Canadian pollution affecting the United States insofar as acid rain and certain other important pollutants. Is that correct? Uh, I agree with Dr. Culp's statements about our future work. We've made a major commitment to this modeling effort and its verification. Now, uh, Mr. Thomas, the ICF report and your testimony compare efforts in Canada with those in the United States to control air pollution. You point out and state Canada has a fundamentally different air pollution situation than in the United States, has adopted a different approach to air pollution control, and, allows, and, and has allowed intermittent controls, fuel switching, and trawl stacks in addition to technological controls. Canada's ambas uh, ambassador, in an August 4 letter to me, agrees that there are both differences and similarities, but he believes that the earlier State Department report ignores the fact that Canada has established additional requirements beyond its ambient air quality requirements. He says it seeks to reduce, uh, reduce and cap acid rain by 1994. He then went on to say this, there is no comparable program that is, uh, and that is the problem. For many of the precursor emissions now causing damage in my country originate in the United States. He continues, we both agree that much has been achieved by our two countries and that more can be done, admittedly at a cost. But delay also entails cost. In your testimony, you mentioned the new Canadian program, Mr. Thomas, and you indicate that it will be a 35 percent reduction by 1994, not a 50 percent reduction as claimed by Canada, and that 60 percent of Canada's acid rain pollution stems from six non-ferrous smelters and one electric utility in eastern Canada, which dominate the sources in eastern, U uh, uh, while the dominant sources in the eastern United States are coal-fired utilities but not smelters. Now my questions. The ICF report seems to indicate that Canada achieved most of its reductions by technology improvements before 1980, and while it has been planning further reductions through 1994 through tighter emission regulations, significant technology-based reductions have not really occurred yet in this decade. Is that true in Canada? They have uh, incorporated in their control program a number of what I would call uh, technological improvements. For instance, the incorporation of acid plants as a part of uh, their smelter program uh, to control off gas, off, off uh, acid gas has been a, I'd, I'd consider that a technological incorporation. Also, modifications of the actual production have process. Have those been done or have they just been planned? Some have been done in their, in their program. Some are planned as a part of their new program. Are more done or more planned? Well, actually, probably more done as far as their smelters are concerned because... Now, those were done before the 1980s, were they not? Most of their reductions did occur by 1979. So uh, the, what they're doing is claiming what they did back in the 70s as opposed to what they're doing now in the 80s. The, the most substantial reduction in SO2 uh, was in the 70s. And, most and that was done by technology as opposed to intermittent controls and things of that kind. Well, a good bit of that was production uh, changes as far as those smelters are concerned. In other words, intermittent operation of the smelter. Uh, production modifications in the smelters themselves. In other words, changing the production process in the smelter that resulted in lower emissions. That's not technology. They, were all, they also incorporated in, in some acid plant additions. So it's a combination of the two. Now, most of that, again, was before 1980? That's correct. Okay. Now, the reductions that have occurred, again, are due now to intermittent controls and production controls, both of which are not available under U.S. laws to electrical utilities emitting SO2. Is that not true? That's correct. Okay. Uh, as you know, in the United States, uh, uh, we have a heavy emphasis on uh, technology controls, particularly for new sources. As a practical matter, we just forbid 
um, intermittent operation of facilities as a, as a control device. As part of our ambient program, you cannot have intermittent control. That's, that's forbidden both by your regulations and also by statute. That's correct. New controls, I gather, have for the largest part not been installed in Canada, isn't that right? In the sense of, of for instance, the in, in the 80s. In, in the kind of new controls that you would think of in the U.S., like scrubbers on power plants, for instance, that, that has not been installed in Canada. Now, have all of the provinces agreed to or signed on to the 1994 plan? Uh, they have not uh, gotten full agreement from all their provinces. My understanding is, is that they clearly have gotten agreement and implementation in the two largest emitting provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec. They're, they've gotten uh, commitments, I believe, from uh, a number of others, uh, uh, New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, very close, I think, to final But until, until the signature is in place, nothing happens in Canada, isn't that well, right? Well, their provincial system, uh, clearly that's the case in, okay. in, in this program. Uh, the provinces, in fact, have the authority to carry forward with implementation. So the province, once there is signature, will move forward, for instance, in uh, Quebec, move forward with regulations so to implement the program. So all of Canada's actions are yet before us. Including, including final signatures in most instances. In, in some, so, uh, the largest provinces are moving forward with implementation. Some of the smallest ones, from an emissions point of view, have yet to go forward. Now, in his August 4, my good friend Mr. Gottlieb, the ambassador from Canada, said this. The calculation that assigned reductions in Canada's acid rain control program will produce a 35% cut in 1980 emission levels is misleading in that it results from a comparison of future allowable emission levels, 1994, to past actual emissions, the 1980 case. If comparisons are to be drawn, surely they should be on the basis of either allowable levels or actual emissions in 1980 and 1994, but not on a combination of the two. Looking at the tables on pages E22 and E23 of the ICF report, now, uh, Mr. Thomas, do you and uh, Dr. Culp agree with the ambassador's criticism, and what is its relevance? Well, our understanding is, is that the 1994 allowables will be the actuals. In other words, it's going to be an emissions cap. The actual emissions at that point will be the same as what's allowed at that point. And a matter of fact, I don't believe they've yet been able to allocate the final 175,000 tons that are required in order to meet that emissions cap. They're working to, to complete that process. So. You need to look, you can call it actuals if you want, because that's my understanding and I think the ICF understanding of what that allowable emissions cap will result in in 1994. You compare it back then to 1980, the actual emissions in 1980 are what you need to look at. And so you're comparing actual to actual, and it's about a 35%. Now, if they're going to beat that emissions cap in 1994, in other words, if it's going to be lower than that, then fine. All they've got to do is state that they're going to lower that cap, and in fact, you'll see that they'll have a higher percentage. At any rate, it, we feel 35% is a significant reduction. It's just a point that you really need to look at where they started and where they, where they intend to end up. What you are saying, then, is that the real test is what, is go is what the facts are as opposed to some uh, assigned value which has no relation to fact. Is that not so? The actual emissions are fact. Yeah. The actual emissions are a fact, and uh, base cases are not a fact. That's correct. And it, it's perfectly all right for our good Canadian friends north of us to tell us how they are, how they are planning to cut from a base case, but, no, uh, but not to for us to assume that that is reality. On the contrary, the reality that we, should, that we should function from is what it is that the Canadians are actually emitting, and then to calculate against that the, the, the cut. Is that not the way it should be done? That's right, and that's, that's what we did. Uh, the chair notes that that my time's expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Kansas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted, if I could, to um, to sort of get back to the basics a little bit in, in this area and and, um, and make sure I understand your testimony even even more clearly. Um, is, is it your testimony and your conclusions after this lengthy uh, study that if present levels of deposition for uh, SO2 and NOx would continue, that we won't have any new acidified lakes. Is, is that what your conclusion is? Essentially. I don't like the word any because uh, clearly there can be a few. 
because they're very special geochemical situations, but in general, yes. Uh, over the next several decades, our models have been projected out that far, and that's what they if, seem if to If present levels continue, then what is the, the greatest danger in your judgment that our country uh, uh, faces as a result of the acid rain problem? I don't think we can say there is any danger beyond whatever we are experiencing now. The trouble is that in some of these effects, we do know what the effect is, maybe zero, in, as in the case of crops, or it may be, uh, there may be some effect that we haven't been able to find yet, such as in the high altitude forests, where we do not know today whether the present levels of acidity are damaging those forests or not. But whatever they're doing, uh, it would appear that it would not get worse. if present levels continue if for present a few levels seconds. Continue. Right. Uh, let, me, let me try and get a handle, if I can, on, on just the dimension of the problem that we have today and the source of that problem from your perspective. Um, as I understand it, in the uh, Adirondacks, we're looking at a situation where 1.7 percent of the lake area and about 10 percent of the lakes in that area are acidified. Is that, is that correct? Yes, using a definition of ANC around zero and a pH of around 5.0. That's correct. What is the case if you raise that pH fi uh, factor, the 5 factor, to say 6? If you raise it to 6, then the, you come to 10 percent of the lake area of those lakes greater than 4 hectares or 10 acres uh, and approximately 27 percent of the number of lakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the small lakes, the very small lakes, bogs, ponds, the small lakes, particularly at higher altitude, are more acidic. There are there are, there are no large acid lakes mm -hmm. anywhere. Okay. If if you used that pH factor of six. Yes. Instead of five. Yes then what would your conclusion be with respect to um, the future acidification of lakes if present levels of emissions continue? Uh, it would not be different. So even if you assume the six pH factor, it is your testimony that we would not see any new We would not see any significant additional lake. Uh, lakes crossing that boundary, if you wish. Can crossing you the boundary of 6 -0. Any new, uh, a significant number, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, or a significant area. You can't say any. I mean, you're just saying there won't be a large increase N in right. the number of acidified lakes, even if you assume a pH factor of 6 instead of the 5 yes. factor that was assumed. Yes. Okay. Um, And that only applies to the glaciated areas. I mean, in the western uh, mountains, there, there are no lakes right now less than six. And in the southern uh, Blue Ridge problems, there are none that are less than six mm -hmm. today. Okay. Um, now, in the Catskills, the lake area that, w that we were talking about was 1.9 percent and 0.8 percent of the lakes. Is that correct? Correct. That was the five. What would be what would be the situation there if you were looking at a factor of six? It would be uh, fourteen percent of the number of lakes and eight percent of the lake area. Sorry, the other way around. It'd be fourteen percent of the lake area and eight percent of the lakes. This is all what tabulated. Is, what is the what is the 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 real difference in terms of the effect on the aquatic life and um, uh, the effect on on the the quality of the water? Uh, between the five factor and the six factor, what's what's the significance of that? Uh, as you go from five to six, there's increasing percentage of the simpler organisms uh, that uh, survive, and the sports fish, essentially above 5.5, are are generally pretty uh, healthy. In Maine, a study was made of many of the lakes there, and they didn't find any really deleterious effects on any lake that had at least 5.5.
but there is a range there. And as I indicated, uh, you, uh, the probability of a very healthy, balanced sports fish population is nearly 100% at 6.0. It's 85% probability at 5.5 and about 60% probability at 5.0. And then it drops off very fast. Mm -hmm. Annette. Let me um, uh, focus a little bit on, on the source of the problem, too, uh, based on, on your report. Can, can you give some indication, based on your study, as to when this problem really developed? Is it, can you scientifically determine that this is something that has happened in the last 10 years? Is, is it happened in the last 20 years? Uh, do we have to go back 50 years to find the source of this problem? Can, can you help us get a handle on that? Yes, at the turn of the century, the SO2 emissions in the eastern United States was only about half what it is today. Is say, it say that again, though. At, at the, the turn of the turn century, of the, century the, SO2 the SO2 emissions were only one half what they are today. But by 1930, they were equal what they are today. Between 1930 and today, yeah, the SO2 emissions oscillated a bit. It went down during the Great Depression in the 30s. It went up during World War II. It went down during the maximum oil use uh, toward the end of the 50s. But, uh, and then it went up to a, a peak in about 1972 when the Clean Air Act came in, and then it's been sharply dropping since then until about today. So that uh, because there have been oxidants in the air that can convert the uh, SO2 to sulfuric acid, uh, the most reasonable understanding is that we have had acid rain somewhere around present levels for 50 years. Uh, we can't quantify that precisely because we don't have data back 1930. Mm -hmm. It has to be inferred from the theory. But we do have a, a good fix that uh, the SO2 emissions were, were quite high at that time. And uh, the, uh, probably the main difference between then and now is that now we have tall stacks, so they go a little further. And the SO2 effects in the cities and on materials was much greater in 1930 than it is today for the same amount of SO2 mm -hmm. because it was concentrated in the locomotives and, and residential burning and things like that in 1930. But the total SO2 is the same as today. Okay. So, so getting back to can, the, the can lake. You look at, can you look at this problem with the lakes, for example, and can you determine exactly or why a certain lake became acidified and another lake did not in, a, in, a, in the same region? Our studies by 1990, I think, will allow us to do that. At the present time, we don't have um, much historical data. The little data we have says that in Wisconsin, for example, the acidity of the lakes was, if anything, uh, a little bit less 30 years ago than it is today. In New Hampshire, it's about level. In the Adirondacks, depending on what you assume, it could be a little more or a little less. But that's the general regional case. If you ask the particular lake, it depends on the geochemistry of the soil. And in some cases, uh, the lake will, will equilibrate with that rain very quickly, as the granite bathtub. In other cases, it may, it may take quite some time. But we don't have much evidence uh, of many lakes trending uh, to be more acid in the last decade where we have made some measurements. There are a few lakes that, are, uh, that do not uh, follow that pattern, but most of them do, namely no trend in the last decade. So, so s since the early 70s even, we have, we have seen a situation where that w it's your testimony at least that the condition has not significantly worsened in the since, since yes. the early 70s. Yeah, w we don't know when during the last 50 years some of these lakes became acid, but we do believe that some of them, the 2% of the lake area, became acid due to acid rain. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have much question about that, but we're trying to, obviously the data puts it in perspective of how much and, and, and how you but, judge But that. you're saying that in the last 10 to 12 years, that we haven't seen a very little change increase in, in right. the number and, and the area of uh, acidified lakes in the country. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is based on uh, about 2,000 lakes that have been sampled statistically uh, to cover all the sensitive areas of the country. Mm -hmm.
I don't have any further questions at this time, Mr. Chairman. The time of the gentleman has expired. Um, Ms. Thomas, Ambassador Gottlieb states that the emission standards for heavy-duty vehicles in Canada will be effective in December 1988. Until now, has Canada had NOx controls as stringent as the United States on motor vehicles? Now, Mr. Chairman, since our last discussion on this, I have got a table here. And let me, let me uh, indicate to you that as far as heavy-duty trucks are concerned, the United States adopted a standard in 1974 uh, for heavy-duty trucks for NOx. The Canadians adopted the same standard for 1975. Then the United States tightened that standard in 1979 uh, and uh, will tighten it again in 1990 uh, and again, uh, um, well, in 1990 and thereafter. And the Canadians have not tightened their standards since 1975. But my understanding is, is that they do have a proposal to tighten their standards, which has not no. yet been adopted. A proposal is like signing the payroll. It doesn't give you the check. It just, it just, it just indicates that something might happen. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Now, Mr. McMillan said recently that he would immediately launch a massive effort to influence the Americans, including a major print campaign on the effects of acid rain, a series of meetings with influential members of Congress, and public speaking engagements across the United States. I believe he has started this this week. I'm told he wanted to visit me, but I regret that I was in Michigan. Now, how is the effort consistent with bilateral confidential conservations with the Canadian, uh, with the Canadians that you spoke about in your testimony, uh, and U.S. lobbying laws. It, it's pretty hard to say that this is bilateral confidential conservation uh, conversations, is it not, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, let me take your question in reverse order. As far as the U.S. lobbying laws are concerned, I believe the State Department's in the process of responding to your letter, uh, and, and will do so in the next couple of weeks. They're researching the answer right now. We, we ask them about lobbying, yes, and, exactly. and we think that it's nice that, that they should address that matter. Yes. Now, what, what <laughs> about the other part? As far as consultation is concerned, uh, we do have the ongoing consultation process underway with Canada. Uh, now, and are, they, are they talking to you confidentially, or are they, are they engaged in a massive public relations effort? Well, as far as the, the uh, bilateral consultation is concerned, that is a confidential process between the U.S. and Canada. And has so they got oh. two. The, one, I is, one is the confidential discussions they're having with you, and one is this massive public relations effort in which they're engaged. Is I had correct? conversation with Mr. McMillan when he was down here uh, about uh, this uh, point you're making. I don't feel, based on what he told me, that, uh, the, that they intend in any way to disrupt the consultation process which is underway. And uh, it didn't appear to me that it's a massive, uh, a quote, massive public relations effort. Uh, well, I, but it, I can only take the man at his word. I assume that he means what he says. Now, maybe he doesn't. Uh, he may mean that. When he defined it to me, it didn't come across as a massive public Maybe he's relation. telling you folks one thing and the Canadians the other. Do you think that's possible? Uh, well, I compare it, for instance, with the amount of money that the Canadian government spends on asbestos information in the United States, and it doesn't appear to me that it'll be near as much. Well, they're doing their best to sell asbestos over here, which is a carcinogen, are they not? That's correct. And our laws now forbid the use of asbestos in most of its industrial and residential applications, do they and, not? And we're in the midst of rulemaking now to determine whether it should be phased out completely. wonder if the Canadians like lung cancer down here and dislike it up there. Um, can you tell us who is representing the United States, first of all, in the confidential discussions, and then in this massive Canadian public relations effort? There is, a, there is a bilateral advisory consultation group that is chaired on the U.S. side by Assistant Secretary Negroponte of the Department of State, participants from all the major agencies, uh, uh, my agency included, uh, that participate uh, with their counterparts from Canada. As far as the massive public relations effort is concerned, I, I know only what I have read and heard from Mr. McMillan. Now, Mr. Thomas, why is the interim assessment limited to research recommendations 
and why does it not include policy recommendations? Is it your view that with this assessment, coupled with other non-federal reports, there is no emergency need for an acid rain control program? In fact, Mr. Chairman, the whole purpose of the NAPEP exercise was a scientific purpose. Uh, and it's, we've been very careful in trying to ensure that the science was, in fact, separate from the policy discussion. The science clearly is for policymakers to use, both myself and yourself and others, as we determine what policy direction to take. Uh, I have said for the last three years, as I've participated in this policy discussion, that policymakers can draw different conclusions, and I've seen them do that about the need to take action. Uh, I have not drawn the conclusion that we should take immediate uh, further control action as a result of the scientific information that I have seen. Now, Ms. Thomas, the statute specifically states that uh, recommendations with regard to legislation and other governmental actions uh, can and should come forth from NAPAP. And indeed, and indeed, it does not state that they may come, come only at the end, but that they may come at any time. Is that not so? I, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. You're not indicating to us then that, the, that NAPAP is not oriented towards giving us some specific policy recommendations and some specific statutory recommendations. That's correct, but the, 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 the effort that we've undertaken in NAPAP, and that's, for instance, why we have a separate policy committee and a science committee, is to try to, in fact, separate those efforts. And what we have here is a scientific assessment document. I, I want to clear, uh, this is not a criticism, I just, just want to make sure that the, that, the, that the program remains oriented towards giving us information and recommendations that may be used by the Congress to deal with this problem if in fact it exists and to the extent that it does exist. Now, Mr. Thomas, um, what are the plans for using regional acid deposition models to compute source receptor relations for policy analysis? Well, a, a major part of, of the work we have underway, and Dr. Culp may want to speak to this in some more detail, is to develop, refine, and verify a uh, regional acid deposition model, which in turn, I think, will give us far uh, better ability uh, uh, to predict source receptor relationships on a more uh, narrow geographic scale, which obviously would have major implications then uh, for policy uh, as far as emission controls are concerned. Uh, on a more narrow geographic scale. Now, can you tell us what the plans are for conducting field experiences and experiments to test the accuracy of the regional acid deposition model? We have a, uh, we have had uh, this under uh, a planning mode for the last uh, year, year and a half, and the actual field studies will begin uh, in 1988. In 88 and 89, there'll be some very intensive exercises using aircraft and many ground sampling stations, tying the actual deposition and the air quality to uh, known emissions and known meteorology. Uh, this is an iterative process. You conduct one of these massive experiments, then you go back and, and uh, test the model with it. Uh, you improve the model, and then you go back and test it again. The goal is that by 1990, <clears throat> this model will be validated adequately so that predictions of source receptor can be made and, and used in policy analysis. I would caution, however, though, this is one of the hardest problems that APAP has in front of us, and uh, I don't think uh, we could guarantee that by 1990 we'll have the kind of precision that's needed. We're going to try very hard. It's a tough scientific problem. Can you tell us, gentlemen, for what terrestrial and aquatic effects will there be accurate dose-response relationships available? Will there be science guidance to policy in the form of the various scenarios? Will there be specific emission reductions recommended or in the study? And will there be specific effects improvements? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, I think, to all of those. Uh, we should have, by 1990, uh, adequate dose response data uh, on forests. We're particularly concerned now about the high-altitude Appalachian forests, uh, which show some uh, serious deterioration. 
We know that natural stresses uh, account for a lot of that. We suspect that air pollution makes a contribution, but we do not know at this time whether the acidity of the clouds, whether the ozone up there, which is on average twice as uh, high in concentration as down in the valley, or whether it's the hydrogen peroxide, or maybe even uh, certain other factors that are causing that deterioration. We will have, I think, the dose response experiments to unscramble those, the relative importance of those effects by 1990. Uh, that then comes down, I think, from your point of view, as to which of these precursors are important, which are doing the damage, if any, and uh, we should have that quantified by that time. One point I would make is that just this last year or two, we've learned the importance of hydrogen peroxide and the fact that it comes from these VOCs, but a lot of the VOC comes from natural Whether most of the hydrogen peroxide that is up there in those clouds is due to natural sources or to man-made sources, and we don't even know that right at this moment, but we should know that by 1990. Now, I've seen a number of recent comments and reports of acid rain threats to the national parks, and a lack of research in acid rain or its effects on our national parks. Mr. Thomas, do you or Dr. Culp agree with these reports? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Hester, who is Associate Director for Natural Resources and Natural Parks Service. It may be well that uh, Mr. Hester will respond. I think that would be very useful. Mr. Hester, would you come forward, please, sir? Um, we'll try. I guess you might as well figure on bringing your chair up, too. I believe, I believe, I believe you, are, you are already sworn, are you not, Mr. Hester? Very well. Then you are recognized for response to that question. Mr. Chairman, I brought with me a brief statement in response to the question you raised. And with your permission, if it's appropriate, I'd like to present that statement. That would be appropriate. I appreciate this opportunity to provide the information that you've requested on the impacts of acid rain and air pollution on the national parks and the actions taken by the Department of the Interior and EPA to address this problem. The Department of the Interior knows from research conducted by the National Park Service <coughs> that acid rain and air pollution can damage some of the resources that units of the National Park Service have been created to protect. The Clean Air Act charges the Secretary of the Interior with an affirmative responsibility to protect from the adverse impacts of air pollution the 48 units of the National Park System designated Class I under that act, namely all national parks over 6,000 acres and wilderness areas over 5,000 acres, which were in existence Mr. on Hester, August, August 7th, Hester, 1977. Please, can, can, can we insert your full statement in yes. the record? Yes. And, and can you give us a response to the question? Yes, is, is what, what is going on with regard to acid rain uh, impacts on the national parks? Yes, sir. Uh, acid rain does does have a negative effect on parks. That is, you can go to parks and measure uh, the low acidities that have been discussed previously today. With reference to the overall question of the report and our reaction to it, one, the report is about two years out of date. A number of things have happened since the report was prepared. It you're, does you're referring to uh, the report, the NAPAP report, or no? You're I'm re referring here to a report by the National Parks oh. and Conservation Association. Uh, the report itself acknowledges that it does not address the overall air quality issue. And that is one of the main ways by which the Park Service has addressed this issue. Because no matter how many places you go and measure the pH, that does not tell you the cause of any problem that might be there. And so we have put our emphasis in two ways. One is as a participant in the NAPAP program, in which we have four major components of, of study sites, watershed sites, and actual monitoring in the NAPAP program in uh, um, a number of our parks, plus our air quality work uh, across the nation to address this overall problem. Not only to determine what's happening in the park, but from where is it coming? We've been uh, interacting with EPA for, for years. We interact with the states in the permit process as it relates to uh, 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 permits. 
And so there are a number of ways in which we are, are addressing it. We can, we can uh, tell you about pHs in the park, or we can tell you about ozone effects on uh, the vegetation. Now, ozone, ozone and pH are, are quite different. That's correct. And ozone and acid rain are quite different. That's and correct. ozone and precursors of acid rain are quite different. That's correct. A lot of people tend to get them confused, and when they talk about ozone, they, they think they're describing acid rain and vice versa, and, and, the, and, and the two are, are, are startlingly distinct, scientifically. You're, you're correct, and we think the bigger, bigger picture and the bigger question is the one of how does it get there, and therefore the, our emphasis on air quality. Are you having evidence of major problems with acid rain in the national parks? Uh, we are not having what I would call major problems. We have some, some cases in which there is uh, uh, acid deposition, but the acidity of the rain is, is different, as has been explained here, or can be quite different than the acidity of the water. And so you have to look at both aspects of that. And then what is the effect of that on the, on the ecosystem? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunkel, you have made a comment in response to the strong interest of this committee with regard to acid deposition, your statement is, is factors other than acidic deposition appear to be more important in the decline of waterfowl populations. And then you go on to say, and that presently you are, and I began quoting, unable to show a strong cause-effect relationship between wetland acidification and the decline of the black duck. You further state that the relationship is, and again quote, a theoretical possibility only. You go on, and, but, that will, but will the research mentioned in your statement fully address and clear up the issues associated with the matter? Yes, sir, that's correct. And we are undertaking uh, some further research. We've had um, two small approaches that um, uh, would indicate there is a problem, but we want to verify that before we go on uh, making any statements concerned with uh, the impact of uh, acid precipitation. Uh, we are undertaking, uh, uh, in, co in coordination with Canada, some of these studies. Uh, we have them set forth and are underway. We feel that they are properly funded at this moment. Uh, what we find out and what we'll need later on, I can't tell you. So you'd say that it is premature at this time to postulate a decline in the black duck related to acid rain or acid precipitation? Yes, sir, that is correct. Let me read a letter or a statement from a letter I received from Mr. Merchant Wentworth of the Isaac Walton League of America. He says as follows, a number of wildlife researchers, including two in the Fish and Wildlife Service, have already demonstrated that waterfowl production appears to be impaired on acidified wetlands. And he goes on to say, one Canadian researcher stated, we already know that acidified wetlands do not produce baby ducks. In testimony submitted to the Health and Environment Subcommittee, noted waterfowl expert C, or rather Frank C. Belrose, concluded, and I'm now quoting, to date, the theory of, acidif of acidification of water areas in the black ducks breeding range is the only theory that offers a plausible explanation for what has happened to the black duck in time and space. Now, you are intimately associated with the Fish and Wildlife Service, have a long history of experience in that agency. Can you uh, give us your comments on those statements? Well, the, the first one with regard to um, our studies, there was a study, it was almost a laboratory experiment and uh, I wouldn't uh, want to make any judgment that uh, this was an overall effect uh, on the northeastern part of the United States and Canada. Uh, the the uh, researcher that made that comment commented on a specific study and what its indications were for that period. We are now expanding that, and uh, certainly uh, I don't think the comments were uh, presented as, gee whiz, we've done these great studies and the evidence is uh, irreposable and, and thus uh, terrible things. So we're, we're underway. For the second comment uh, by uh, Dr. Belrose, uh, I don't think he stated uh, any specific um, documentation. I think he was uh, uh, making subjective remarks. 
and uh, we've not seen any new or uh, outstanding information that would uh, back up his statements. Now, the black duck is affected by many circumstances. Yes, sir. Habitat loss in the nesting areas and in the wintering areas. Yes, sir. Both of those are having a severe adverse impact on the black duck, are they not? That is, that is correct. Black duck is also affected by uh, water pollution, is it not? Correct. It is also affected by changes in agricultural practices in its areas. Very definitely. It is also affected by drought uh, in some of its production areas, is it not? That is correct. And there has been drought in some of its production areas in the last few years, is it not? That is correct. It also has a difficult time competing in terms of hybridization with the mallard, does it not? That is correct. And that is causing a significant production of mallard black duck hybrids, which look like mallards. Is that not so? That is correct. So we are losing black duck population to mallards through interbreeding. Is that not so? That is correct. You're answering your own question, sir. I, you're, you're answering. I'm making statements and you're agreeing or disagreeing. Uh, so there are many circumstances contributing to the visible and, and real loss of the black duck. Is that not so? That is correct. It is curious you noted in your statement that the population of mallards have during this period of time increased. Yes, sir. In mm -hmm. the same, in, in, and that is so in the black duck range, is it not? Yes, uh, per perhaps not as far north into the major breeding areas, uh, Mr. Chairman, but uh, in that intermediate zone, um, Oh, as they leave the breeding grounds, then into the wintering areas, uh, the mallard population increase is uh, bringing about severe competition to the black duck. So, for, what we for might space. assume is so. What we might assume is that we're now getting a race of hybridized black ducks up there, which have the physical characteristics of mallards. Is that not so? That is a possibility. I wonder if acid rain's causing that. Uh, I, I wouldn't answer that. You might have to answer that one, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just say this, doctor. I used to be chairman years ago, and it was a very happy time for me of the sub, subcommittee on fisheries and wildlife conservation. I worked with your very fine agency a lot, and one of my major efforts was to see to it that we restored, protected, and enhanced not only the populations of waterfowl, but other species and we, that we protected and enhanced their habitats and their opportunities to survive. And I'm sure you remember the days. And they were great days and they were very happy ones for me. And there were some very constructive environmental and conservation consequences of that time. We're making every effort to still carry out that approach. And waterfowl is a major portion of our work and our direction. Well, you come from a great agency and you can be proud of what you do. Thanks, sir. Um, Mr. Slattery, may I be recognized to sure. observe that I've been duly impressed with my chairman's knowledge of the of ducks. Shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> Hybridized black ducks, in particular, seems to be a unique interest of yours, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I, I would observe that that we have spent some three hundred million dollars on this study. Is, is that is that correct? It's what I've been advised. Approximately right. Three hundred million dollars on this study that involves um, nearly every agency of the federal government that would be affected by by uh, this problem: the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Commerce, the Council on Environmental Quality, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Interior the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Science Foundation, the Department of State, and the Tennessee Valley Authority have come together and spent $300 million in an effort to enlighten all of us on the acid rain problem. And this study has taken, what, seven years to complete? Is that correct? Well, the completion will be 10 years. Uh, it takes two or three years to start up any significant research project. Uh, we started to get significant data flowing in uh, in 1985. So we've had about two or three years of, of strong data and, and scientific publications. And so we're sort of halfway through so far as the actual data flow is concerned. Well, I am, you might imagine, uh, I'm impressed by the fact that so many agencies have been able to work together on anything. 
And uh, one of the things that is even more amazing is that there is a report uh, from all of these different agencies that would agree to anything. And I'm just curious that in the process of compiling all of this information and doing all these laborious studies, uh, were there scientists and are there scientists within any of these agencies that are involved that have felt strong enough about a dissenting view that would be central to any of the conclusions that this study has made? And if, if they, are there any that have felt strong enough to write a minority view or a minority opinion or uh, dissent from the conclusions? Well, again, I, I worry about your word, any, because I can't know about oh. all these uh, people. But uh, every chapter has gone through many, many iterations. It's circulated back to the task group. You see, in, in each of these subject areas, we have a task group con consisting of people in agencies and outside, leading scientists in their field. They were all involved all the way through this. and. Uh, well, let me put it another way, Ms. Dr. I, Culp. I mean, you're the director of research. Have you solicited or have you invited uh, scientists from any of these agencies that have participated in this study to submit in writing uh, written dissenting views or minority views about any of the conclusions that, that this, this uh, study has, has uh, made? Not the way you put it. We didn't explicitly write, write them and say, please, if you want to prepare a minority report, do so. But the experts in each of these fields uh, were deeply involved in the, the final version. And we had criticisms and significant scientific discussions right up until the last few weeks. And then we had very senior scientists in the agencies uh, uh, dealing with reaching a final consensus. And they, in turn, were in touch with their experts both in their agencies and their contractors. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a very broad sense of consensus here, but I certainly wouldn't say there aren't some. I, I'd, be more, I'd be perfectly honest to say that there are certainly some who would have um, maybe weighed things a little bit differently. But sure. as far as the way you put it, is anything basic or substantive that they would disagree with, I think mm -hmm. uh, that might be hard to find. M Mr. Thomas, uh, do you concur with the comments that Dr. Culp has just made? I would concur with that, Mr. Slatter. So in within the Environmental Protection Agency, that agency of our government that uh, is charged with the responsibility of enforcing our environmental laws, for the most part, uh, you don't have anybody over there that, that, that uh, feels so strongly that a conclusion arrived at in this study is in error so as to be motivated to write a written dissenting view. I have not had that in my agency. I have not solicited that in my agency. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be helpful if you would invite someone that might? I think the process we used to develop the report, in fact, was an implicit solicitation of that. In other words, mm -hmm. the people in my agency, and by the way, of the money spent, a large portion of it was spent by my agency. Mm -hmm. and the aquatics work, for instance, is largely directed by EPA. I've got, I've got really first-class scientists who've worked on that work. Mm -hmm. I have been in sessions with them at length over the last three years. I feel as we came to conclusion and as their work was incorporated into this interim assessment, if any of those people had felt that it was being misrepresented, if they had felt that the conclusions or the work itself was being misrepresented, they would have come to me or they would have ensured that a supervisor came to me. I would have known that. I didn't know it. So I feel the process, in fact, would have, would have allowed implicitly for them to come forward if they dissented. Let me, let me ask you another sort now, of basic question. And let question. me just make one final point on that. Mm -hmm. There was extensive discussion as we concluded this report finally. And, and uh, those scientists, for instance, the principal science, the principal author, participated in the final parts of the process. And there was debate. What's going to go in? What's not going to go in? How will it be formed in final conclusion? And they participated in that and felt, uh, from my point of view, comfortable with final conclusion. Therefore, we signed on to it. From a scientific point of view, EPA signed on to the body of this report and concurred in. I'm, I'm just uh, curious now. Do you project and do you believe that we're going to see a significant increase in, say, the next 10 years uh, in the amount of, of emissions and in the amount of uh, acidic deposition? Yeah, what, uh, what is your view? Based on, based on the projections we've made in the various uh, scenarios, we don't think there's going to be a significant increase in emissions if you define significant, for instance, for sulfur dioxide as greater than, say, 
10 percent in the next 10 years. We don't think it will be greater than that, and there's the potential it will be less. If you look at nitrogen oxide. 10 percent, and that's over the total 10-year period. That's that correct. correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And how about nitrogen oxides? Nitrogen oxides, uh, there is the potential for it to increase greater than that. How much uh, greater? Al although I, I, I must say, I must say not over the next 10 years because of the impact of the mobile source controls that are going in place and those we have in place mm -hmm. on, on trucks. I'd say after that period of time is when we project there may be greater increases in nitrogen oxides if we don't impose additional controls, which may well be imposed. And is it your testimony? Under current law. Okay, well now, be. is it your testimony then, Dr. Culp, that based on that kind of, a, of an increase, that we're not going to see any uh, significant deterioration in the aquatic life and in the, in the, in the, air, the water quality in our lakes and in the, in the forest of our country? I think that's what the science says right now, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, let me just follow up then with the, the sort of the obvious question. As, as, you, uh, as you all know, um, there has been inter uh, legislation introduced that would, uh, that would um, attempt to reduce uh, SO2 emissions by some 10 million tons a year and NOx uh, emissions by some 4 million tons a year and at a cost to the American public uh, of billions. And I'm, I'm just curious, based on the scientific studies that you all have performed, that have uh, cost the taxpayers some $300 million. In your considered judgment, what would we get? What would the, what would the people of this country get uh, if, in fact, we uh, did pass this kind of legislation uh, that would bring about the kind of reductions in SO2 emissions and NOx emissions that I alluded to uh, in the next 10 years? I mean, what benefit would we derive if we adopted that kind of legislation and move forward with a program to achieve those kind of reductions? Mr. Slattery, I think there are two points I'd like to make in response. One is I don't see any indication from the scientific information that we need that kind of reduction in that time frame uh, at all from this information. I don't see that that's needed. And therefore, whatever benefits would derive from it, as far as environmental benefits are concerned, I think would be benefits that were far beyond and far too soon, uh, the kind of information we see here leads us to conclude that over the next two to three years, as we try to finish up the uncertainties in this work, we may conclude that, yes, in fact, as we look at, for instance, both in this work, additional information on forest, additional information on aquatics, additional information on materials, as we look at in our ongoing agency work additional uh, information on visibility, additional information on health effects, that we may need substantial reductions. But I don't think we've got the information today to lead, that, lead us to that conclusion at all. And as you know, I've opposed that legislation. I've said that clearly this information does not support it. It also supports the fact that we've got sufficient time to draw the proper conclusions about what additional controls, if any, are needed. And I think this research program is leading us in exactly the right direction to give us that information. Dr. Culp? I would say just from a technical side, you ask what could happen <coughs> in a number of these areas, such as the forests, we, we just can't say at the moment because we cannot identify the damage. Uh, it may not be significant. We don't know yet. We can't quantify the effect on materials yet, but we will by 1990, so I can't tell you whether we're going to have any improvement or not. But it's been and your testimony that if present levels of depositions are maintained, that no significant deterioration would occur. No, no new, no new deterioration over what we now have, whatever that may be. But in the case of lakes, we do have a quantified number of lakes that are acid, have been for some period of time. And uh, let's take the 2 percent of the Adirondack Lake area, which is the most extensively impacted area in the United States. Uh, if we were to reduce emissions significantly, we would have some reduction in the deposition of acidity, and some of those lakes uh, would become less acid. I can't tell you today exactly how many, but clearly that would happen. That would be an ancillary benefit for uh, ultimate reduction of SO2. Mm -hmm. So absent reductions, there will be no improvement in, in the condition of the lakes that, we're, that we have that's, talked about. That's fair to say, yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
<clears throat> so what we might be buying then, if we as a society conclude that we want to spend whatever, billions of dollars over the next 10 years to reduce uh, asset depositions, would be an improvement in, in these lakes. That's maybe one thing we could be buying. We don't know for sure how much improvement, but we would be buying some improvement. Fair statement? Fair statement. It depends. What about uh, with the forest? What about with the forest in the area? Well, there you're, you're only talking about time, the time frame. Uh, let's say the, the question is to recover the 2% of the lakes that are now acid, or too, too acid for a healthy fish. Okay? Let's say that's what we want to do. Uh, that, uh, that could be done, <coughs> uh, as you say, at a certain expense uh, more quickly, uh, but the ongoing advancing technology over time will eventually eliminate the emissions. And uh, so it's a matter it, how long you want to take. <coughs> how long would it take, for example, in your judgment, if this kind of legislation was passed, to uh, restore some of, the, some of these lakes, 2% in the Adirondacks? Realistically, a couple of decades, I guess. <clears throat> if the legislation was passed. What if the legislation is not passed? I mean, they're permanently lost and permanently <clears throat> acidified? No, no. Uh, given, a, given a few more decades, uh, it should probably all go away with advancing technology on emissions. Because when, when emerging technology can be employed on new plants, uh, they will have far less emissions than even NSPS plants today. And that's what the, I guess, the Clean Coal Program is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Time the gentleman has expired. Um, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Steed. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, might I interrupt just a second? I'm, I'm going to have to leave, but, but uh, I have found the testimony this morning in this hearing to be, uh, to be uh, very interesting and enlightening, and I would uh, encourage the chairman, and I'm, I'm sure in, in his in his wisdom and, and, and consistent with his tradition of fairness that uh, he will give those that might have differing views of this study an equal opportunity to be heard before the, before the committee. We will do that at the first appropriate time. I thank the chairman. Um, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Steed, I uh, presume that you both agree that expertise differ by law and in fact. I observe that EPA has the expertise in environmental control and NHTSA has the expertise in safety. Is that correct? I'd agree with that statement, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thomas? I think that's a charter. I agree with that. Now, um, Ms. Steed, in your testimony today, you state at page two, and I quote, we believe, however, that onboard systems will not, imp not improve and could degrade safety. In a letter on July 21 to the subcommittee, EPA said as follows, that the overall fuel system safety for in-use vehicles could be improved with the implementation of onboard controls. And EPA's technical report states that implementing, and I quote, onboard controls could actually result in net improvement in overall fuel system safety. The NHTSA and EPA statements seem to be totally at odds one with the other. Did EPA consult with NHTSA before sending the letter to the subcommittee and before it, fina before it finalized its technical report? A number of people uh, on the different, on our various staffs have talked to each other, but with regard to looking at the July 21st letter or knowing its contents, no, sir, we were not consulted in that regard. Do you agree um, with EPA that onboard systems can have a net improvement in safety in the light of your testimony today? At this point, no, Mr. Chairman, we do not. Can you tell us, um, uh, Mr. Thomas, please, on what basis do you make or does your agency make the allegation that onboard safety, or rather that safety could be improved by onboard systems? Mr. Chairman, as a part of our environmental expertise, we have uh, very expert uh, auto engineering talent and a laboratory uh, that carries out our overall mobile source program, as you know. As a part of this rulemaking, which has been extensive in the technical review uh, by our own staff as well as contract personnel over the years, 
uh, we've looked at a number of aspects of the onboard issue, including the design and actual construction of various alternatives for onboard engineering on vehicles. Uh, we also uh, completed a safety analysis, which we have incorporated and put out for public comment on the onboard issue. Uh, as Ms. Steed indicated and I as in, have indicated, there have been discussions back and forth between our staffs along the way. The specific part of the conclusion uh, about a net safety improvement from onboard has to do with several factors. One, the additional, the capture of additional vapors as far as the uh, automobile is concerned by the enlarged canister from the current excess evaporative emissions that are occurring uh, with the existing systems. Uh, secondly, the... That's, uh, not, that's not a safety issue, though. Well, it, it has the potential of being a current safety issue. Uh, how, does it, how, does this, how does this help in the event of a collision? Uh, there uh, would not be uh, the excess of vapor emissions both during running time or uh, at the point of uh, stop. So in, in point of, in because point it'd of fact, be captured by the, it'd be captured by the enlarged canister. One of the problems we've got now is the excess evaporative emissions from the existing system because of high bu uh, fuel volatility. And as you know, we have an evaporative control system on all cars now, 180 million of them. But how would, this, how would this contribute to safety in the event of a collision, this enlarged uh, system? We don't think there's any safety problem from the enlarged canister, no, no, no. and in fact, how would it contribute to safety? You you have made the, the statement that only it would contribute to safety. Now I'm curious, what is what is what is the I fact? I think when we looked at the that? overall safety benefit, we looked at three safety benefits as far as the onboard uh, rule is concerned. Two of them are clearly at the station, uh, at the pump. Uh, one has to do with the elimination of the fuel that's often spit back at the pump, therefore fuel spillage at the stations. Uh, uh, the second one uh, has to do with the vapor emissions during refueling themselves at the station. Both of those things would be eliminated by the onboard rule. The second one has to do with the evaporative emissions from the vehicle itself. Currently there are excessive evaporative emissions during running of the vehicle, at the time of stopping the vehicle. Uh, uh, because of the problems of the current system, the current evaporative control system not being large enough as far as the canister is concerned. Additionally, we do these, feel these, that these, the are spec these are speculative, are they not? Pardon? These are speculative, are they not? These speculative. are speculative, are they not? Well, we think that the uh, capture of the uh, uh, vapors, both at refueling and, and as far as the existing systems are concerned, are in or will be fact uh, as far as the design of the systems are concerned. You, you think that? Well, uh, our engineers have actually completed systems to show that that would be the case. Ms. Steed, do you agree with that statement? No, sir. The, <coughs> systems, that we have look, the systems that we have looked at that have been uh, designed by a number of, of different parties, uh, I believe the auto manufacturers have, have attempted to make some prototype systems and so forth would add such additional complexity to the fuel system that we believe that, in fact, it may uh, be a safety problem. So I could not agree with Mr. Thomas's statement. Are these production systems, Mr. Thomas? No, there are no production systems. So, so these, are, these, are, these are test models and test beds and things of that kind. Is that right? It's been, it's been engineering studies that can we've you, done. Can you make a flat statement as to how they would work in, in a finished system, uh, which, would be, which would be marketed and which would be run through the production system? No, but I feel we've got to come to that conclusion before we have a final rule. I also feel that both under our certification requirements and Ms. Steed's, uh, those conclusions have got to be drawn by the automakers before the vehicles can be uh, sold. Uh, I'm curious if that isn't getting the horse or cart a little in front of the horse. We're, we're talking about having a system which is safe before it goes into the automobile. That's correct. That's a judgment that has to be made by you and your agency in connection in connection with your rulemaking, is it that's not? That's correct. And, 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 and that cannot be speculative. That's got to be bottomed on some kind of hard knowledge. And we feel like it will be. We feel the process both up to this point and the process that we're currently conducting uh, will provide the hard fact to back up a final conclusion. And if that so, conclusion... So you don't have those hard facts now? We have some. But you don't we have... Had, I thought we had a, a good body of technical information, frankly, to support the rulemaking that we went forward with. We want to expand on, expand on that technical information. 
I've looked at models, for instance, of, of uh, onboard systems that have been designed by our engineers. I've looked at systems that have been designed by others uh, on vehicles. None of, the ones none that have been designed by the ones that have been. None of these are production. Pardon? None of these are production. Uh, production? No, not production in the sense of uh, uh, assembly line production. No, they're not. Do the, they the, tell you the model anything? that's been designed by our engineers, for instance, is a relatively simple upgrade of the existing evaporative control system with an enlarged canister, a uh, valve operation at the filler uh, portion of the uh, tank, uh, and an additional tube that would go from there into the existing evaporative control system. It's do you, a relatively do you simple have, upgrade. Do you have any information as to how these systems would work in the event of a collision or under high heat? or great cold, or vibration, or if subject to uh, different kinds of mechanical stresses as the vehicle was operated? Uh, we have uh, uh, looked at some of those issues. And have you ever run any tests? We have, we have not run tests, for instance, such as crash tests required by vehicle manufacturers before have a car you, is uh, you've not, manufactured. Have you consulted with Ms. Steed with regard to these questions? We, we have consulted with uh, Ms. Steed's agency. Do you have correspondence on that process. matter? Pardon? Do you have correspondence on that matter? We, we have correspondence on the consultations we've had with Ms. Have Steed. You, uh, have, what have been Mrs. Steed's recommendations? Uh, well, I think she just gave you some of them. Those basically they, they, are consistent. I, I, Although I, I must say that her recommendations have uh, uh, seemed to become more concrete uh, most recently concerning this issue. They do not appear to be. Um, enthusiastic about the safety of this particular system, do they? I think Ms. Steed is concerned about safety, as I am and as, a, as you are. Uh, we all intend to go forward to ensure that the safety issue is resolved satisfactorily. Now, Mr. Thomas, you and Ms. Steed both indicate that rather uh, than Congress enacting legislation requiring consultation between your two agencies, you are working to formalize consultation administration administratively. I am not satisfied that that is going forward. Uh, do you have a memorandum of understanding between your agencies? Uh, we have proposed one to the National Highway Traffic Safety Would you submit that to us? I'd be pleased to. Uh, are you in agreement with that memorandum of understanding, Ms. Steed? I'm in agreement with the concept, Mr. Chairman. We provided yesterday a few comments to EPA that I think would uh, improve the memorandum of understanding. Uh, I'm, I'm in accord with the concept. But the concept and an understanding are, are somewhat different, I'm sure, as you both understand. Uh, Ms. Steed, you and the NTSB have said that the addition of onboard controls will do the following, and I quote now, add complexity to vehicle fuel systems and increase the opp opportunities for fuel system fires. The Insurance Institute agrees. Now, EPA's July 21 letter to the subcommittee says that its analysis and I now quote, concludes that straightforward, reliable engineering solutions exist, and I close quote, to resolve potential problems. Do you agree with EPA's analysis? Uh, no, sir, we do not agree with that statement. Have you consulted with Ms. Steed on, on your conclusions on the question of safety, Mr. Thomas? Uh, we have consulted as we've gone along on conclusions. And she has advised you that she does not agree with your conclusion. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, at a previous hearing we had, for instance, uh, on this issue, the deputy uh, of uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, I think, he, I, 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 as I recall, agreed basically with a similar statement that I made at that time, but made a very strong statement that he felt uh, that lead time was going to be essential for the actual incorporation Mrs. of those. Mrs. Uh, Steed's, Ms. Steed's comments are different today. And I assume that she, being the head of the agency, speaks to the agency. And what, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is on what basis do you make the statement that you have made when, you, when, when, Ms., when Ms. Steed's agency, which is charged with handling automobile safety, advises you differently? And what hard information and what scientific work have you done to establish the credibility of that statement? I think we've, we've gone forward and completed a safety analysis, and our engineers have designed uh, uh, safe, uh, designed alternative systems to incorporate on board into uh, vehicles that have consulted with Ms. Steed's agency, have consulted with many others, and it's on the basis of that that we've uh, made the conclusion have these that we systems did. Ever However, been road, have these uh, systems ever been road tested? Uh, there have been onboard systems that have been road tested. I've seen vehicles with onboard well, systems. Well, have your on engineer them. systems been road tested? Uh, 
not to my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. Well, how, how are you able to tell me then that they, that they will work well in practice if they've not been road tested? Mr. Chairman, based on our engineering analysis to this point, we feel there are alternatives that uh, will be satisfactory with road testing, but it's the entire but process we have underway right that, now to challenge that. You don't know that, do you? Uh, in, the, in the sense of a road testing demonstration or a crash test, uh, no, I don't. Okay. Are you, are you telling us that road tests are no longer necessary to, to test important questions relative to performance of systems? I believe that the certification processes that are required by NHTSA as well as our agency would require those kinds of tests. I'm, I'm just wondering, you have very extensive road testing that's required with regard to air pollution. Uh, are you telling us that those are not needed and perhaps maybe we might save a lot of money both for the government and for the companies by dispensing with that particular device? I, I not only think they're, re they're, they're necessary, they're required by law. Now, Ms. Steed, the EPA's June technical report states, and I quote now, depending on how high a priority a manufacturer assigns to safety, or if significant in-use risk is perceived, a collapsible bladder tank design could be used to meet the onboard requirement. EPA then adds, and I quote again, uh, that it, it uh, rather adds that it, and I now quote, plans to further explore the cost and technological feasibility of bladders as well as their safety and emission benefits. And I close quote. NTSB said, that the collapsible bladder is not a, and I quote, viable solution in the immediate future, close quote. Certainly not in 24 months and may even present hazards. I, uh, do, you, do, you wanna, do you wanna comment on that? It certainly is not a short-term solution, Mr. Chairman. I think there's been some confusion in the past over what we're talking about when we talk about a bladder. In the past, there was a bladder used in one vehicle uh, to provide additional safety uh, with the fuel tank system. That was a different type of bladder than one that would be required with an onboard system. It's, it basically conformed to the configuration of the, the gasoline tank itself. It did not contract as gasoline was used out of the tank and was certainly made of different materials uh, than a, an onboard system that involved a bladder would have to be made of. Our feeling at the moment is that it is possible that, that perhaps in the future that technology may be viable, but it certainly isn't right now. The materials uh, to do this are not well known. The design of how one it would be placed in the fuel tank itself is not understood uh, at well at all, and as I said, it's not certainly not a short-term technology. Now, the, some of the comments I observed were interesting from the manufacturer. It said, bladder material durability is unknown. Can you address the question of durability of the bladder material, Mr. Thomas? Or no, I can't, Mr. Chairman. Pardon? No, I can't address that. So, so we don't know whether it's going to be durable, given the stresses that it would take in the particular location in the automobile and the, and the movement of fuels and things of that kind. Um, says water condensation between tank and bladder poses a corrosion risk, and ice formation could cut the bladder. Has, has your study addressed that matter, Mr. Thomas? I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Do Chairman. Do you have a comment, Ms. Uh, Ms. Deed? That is a concern that we would share, and I believe that uh, one of the auto manufacturers is looking further into that technology. Um, it goes on to say that a nozzle seal system must be added, Mr. Thomas. Do you have a comment on that as to whether or not that would be needed? As a part of the, uh, uh, as a component of the overall bladder technology? That's correct. I, I don't have knowledge of that, Mr. Chairman. Is that important? I just don't have knowledge of the particular comment nor the issue that's being raised. Um, it, it, is, it is an issue as far as uh, evaporative emissions are concerned, and that is the emissions from the fuel, fuel tank during refueling are what we want to capture. Uh, and the two ways to do it is either by capturing it through a bellows process or by capturing it with a system that will ensure that they're not released. It, it comments in, in this regard. Uh, refueling vapors would exceed EPA rules. Do you want to comment, Mr. Thomas? No, I can't comment on that, Mr. Chairman. It says further, known membrane materials are permeable. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I, I, I have Do no knowledge. Do your engineers know the answer to that question? They may well know the answer to all but of those But you don't know questions. whether they do? I don't. That does affect the reliability of the statements made by EPA up to this time, does it not? In what regard, Mr. Chairman? Big pardon? In what regard? Well, if you've got a, if you've got a permeable membrane, you have a big problem. 
Uh, I'm, I, I, uh, You're, if you have a permeable membrane, it, 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 it in turn releases emissions, which become a problem. Is that not so? Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just don't have knowledge of the personal knowledge of the, the they uh, raise comments you're making and questions you raised. Uh, my engineers uh, in the uh, study you noted uh, did look at as one component that could be uh, offered in an alternative design for safety purposes the addition of bladders and fuel tanks. As a matter of fact, I think the suggestion came from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that that was one of the technologies for the long term that, had, that, that, that was do, under review. They do raise questions, though, about the viability of the bladder system and its compliance with law, do they not? Oh, I understand that, yes. Um, what is the basis, then, for EPA suggesting the use of the bladder as a panacea? I don't think we did. Uh, I, I am compelled to uh, read from the technical report of EPA, which states as following. Depending on how high a priority a manufacturer assigns to safety or if significant in-use in risk is perceived, a collapsible bladder tank design could be used to meet the onboard requirement. That's pretty. That's a pretty final statement from your agency, isn't it? Uh, should I believe that statement now after your testimony to me, or should I not? Sounds more final than uh, I would make it after reviewing the issue with my engineers. I uh, drew the conclusion from the briefings I had with my engineers that that was an alternative design from a safety point of view that was worthy of and was, in fact, under review uh, by auto manufacturers that may well be a component of an onboard redesigned system. Um. Let me read here. It says, bladder tanks could lead to a substantial improvement in the fuel system safety by providing an additional shell of protection to help reduce fuel spillage in the case of an accident. Also, bladder tank could eliminate essentially all the safety concerns raised regarding the control, control of refueling emissions. Now, that would only be true if you change the design of the nozzle or the uh, inlet into the tank. Um, is it, and I'm reading here from the technical report uh, put out by EPA. It, is that, are, I might agree that now after your discussions with me that this is a, a good evaluation of the situation or that it is not? Pardon? Am I, to, am I on the basis of your testimony this morning now to think that this is a good evaluation or a bad evaluation? I think it was a good evaluation. We've put it out for comment, Mr. Chairman. It uh, was well, an Well, you're saying it's good. It, it, it you're telling me then it's good for a listening comment as opposed to uh, being something on which we could we we could uh, place reliance or or could assume that it is a conclusive and final and correct statement. No, it was an alternative design that was incorporated in there as one way to deal with this issue. Uh, clearly, as you indicated, people have feelings about that as far as whether it's any kind of short-term solution, whether it may be a long-term solution. It's one that, that uh, uh, was developed uh, by well, our engineers. This appears under the statement, opportunities for improvement. That's correct. And, and it goes on to say, uh, early it says, implementing onboard controls could actually result in a net improvement in overall fuel system safety. I think with the uh, redesign work that some of the manufacturers are looking at, uh, that's a fair statement. That they're not, I thought they, you were giving me to understand in your earlier responses that it was somewhat speculative. Well, my point being that in... in At in, least with regard to bladders. Yes. My point being that the auto manufacturers, I think, can look at a fairly uh, simple upgrade uh, to incorporate onboard controls of the existing evaporative emission systems. By simple, I mean uh, uh, limited numbers of additions of equipment, okay. or they can look at a more extensive upgrade of their entire uh, fuel system. And this was talking about a more extensive upgrade and incorporating a concept which has been uh, uh, noted for the long term. Ms. Steed, at page 41 of the EPA technical report, EPA concludes that there will be little maintenance of onboard controls. On the basis of current information, knowledge, and materials, do you agree with EPA, particularly where a mechanical seal would be used? That there would be little maintenance required? says it would be little maintenance required. That may very well be, and from an emissions standpoint, that may be good enough. But regularly, we see designs that manufacturers have in good faith produced that, that may have something go wrong, and we will ultimately have a safety recall, something that was unintended, 
unenvisioned that develops, uh, even that does not involve maintenance. It may be that the durability, for example, of a mechanical. So you scale. have some apprehension then about about the truth of that statement. I'm concerned. Yes. Very well. Ms. Steed, I understand that if liquid fuel reaches the canister in any way, it will render the charcoal ineffective. Is that a, is that a problem, and do you agree? That's my understanding. Uh, Mr. Thomas, would you want to give us a comment on that? If liquid fuel reaches the canister, would it create, would it create problems? Yes, I was trying to verify because my understanding is, is that that is not the case. And in fact, what you, what you would end up with is saturated charcoal, which is what you end up with with, with uh, large uh, vapor emissions as well. But you can purge that off. That's, that's the point of the purging system, unless I'm misunderstanding. In what, exactly. in what period of time could you purge that? And could you purge it of the heavier components of the petroleum fuel? Gasoline is a mixture, if, if you will recall, Mr. Thomas, of a large number of constituents, some of which are, are resins, tars, some of which are, are heavy oils, and some of which are, are uh, substances which are not known for their volatility, some of which will simply adhere to metal surfaces and other solid surfaces for a long period of time. Mr. Chairman, I guess I have not uh, uh gotten information from my engineers that the problem you're indicating would be a problem, that the purging system of have the they, canister. Have they looked at it? Have we? It's, it's, it, what we're talking about is, 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 is the existing evaporative systems. Is that what you're asking me questions on? We're and how that would relate to an upgraded under system? Systems, uh, Pardon? Under current system, the problem, uh, I'm not aware of a problem, but I'm asking no, I'm not either. That's why I'm having a hard time understanding, because under the, the system we're system proposing, be much it would be the same as the existing system. It's an is upgraded it, canister. It's a well, large are you canister. Telling, are you telling me that you can meet your requirements with regard to air pollution by simply increasing the size of, of current canisters? No, but as far as the purging process is concerned, but uh, I think it's the same purging process. Ms. D, do you want to comment? If, yeah, I would like to have George say something, but if my understanding is correct, you, your question was whether liquid gasoline in the canister would uh, damage the canister and therefore create a problem. And it's my understanding that if liquid gasoline reaches the canister, which it is not supposed to do, that it does destroy the capacity of the canister. And in that sense, if it, if it renders part of the canister inoperable, you don't have the full canister to get the vapors, and therefore you might have vapor uh, loss. And that's, that's our problem. Particularly, particularly if the heavier components, particularly if the heavier components and the less volatile components of the gasoline impact charcoal. Isn't that right? Well, now you're beyond my level of expertise. And, and gasoline in the tank does over time degrade into gums, in, into into tars and resins and complex and complex organic compounds that are that that ha, that are of very low volatility, so that they would not be purged. Isn't that so? I think in uh, in accordance with your earlier statements, Mr. Chairman, I would have to defer to EPA on their expertise in that area. But we've been told in our reviews with the manufacturers that if liquid gasoline reaches a canister, it does damage the capability of the canister to accept vapors. Under that scenario, since you don't have the same capacity, there are scenarios where you would have uh, vapors going into the engine compartment. And it turns out we just were notified the uh, day before yesterday of a recall from Audi where in, uh, in their current evap system, that's exactly what's happening. It's not that liquid gasoline is reaching the canister, but the canister is of such a capacity that the, um, under a certain scenario of topping off the gas tank, uh, the um, canister is saturated, uh, vapors reach the engine compartment and are possibly ignited from an uh, uh, exhaust system source. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have investigated 12 such fires from, from that problem. I think you're raising a question here that, that, that uh, Ms. Deed, you ought to address. The EPA technical report also states at page 41 that NHTSA files revealed only 12 cases that could even be remotely linked to the evaporative emission system out of 3,000 families which have been certified by EPA with evaporative emission systems. I understand that NHTSA's review shows that a substantial number of recalls, including some recently, 
I believe one of those is the Audi situation, which you allude at this time. Do you have some further comment on this? We've there have taken been a number of recalls since 76, have there not, for this very reason? Since 1976, we have taken a look at recalls that might involve fuel systems or uh, evaporative emissions related controls on the fuel systems, and we find about 54 of them, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Thomas, are, are, have you consulted with NHTSA about this matter? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have had conversations back and forth with NHTSA related have you to at the number of recalls. No, as a matter of fact, that number is higher than the number I had thought. Now, that we put that out would tend to indicate that your technical report is deficient in, well, in, in discussing well, this matter, would it not? They, they reviewed and commented on that technical report and didn't indicate that that number was wrong at that time. Well, Ms. Steed, do you want to comment on that last statement? Yes, I would. We have, uh, since the last hearing, gone over in more detail the, the recalls. We categorize them, and we may have just looked at or just pulled at one point things categorized as evaporative emissions recalls. In fact, there are some other fuel system recalls that involve emission controls that, as you read the individual report of each recall, you will find that it is related. And so we have just updated our files, too, in fairness to Mr. Thomas. I don't believe they had the opportunity to see all of those recalls. Are you aware of these recalls, Mr. Thomas? Well, I am now, Mr. Chairman. Uh, out of well, I've, a, I've, out I've come for you. Do we have to have hearings to have you folks talk with, with Ms. Steed? And, no, but I think it's Ms. Steed. Or as are you Ms. able to get together and talk to them without us helping? As Ms. Steed indicated, they've just uh, completed some of their updated information on these recalls. As a matter of fact, one of them indicated was just a couple of days ago, I believe, on the Audi recall. But I would, I would indicate, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that out of the thousands of recalls over that period of time, uh, we have this number related to uh, emission systems, right. and I would venture to say that a great many of those were basically uh, 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 mechanical problems uh, that were developed in the uh, uh, production process and were probably voluntary recalls, most of them on the part of the manufacturer to pull the car back and correct those mechanical problems. Ms. Steed, were these, were these recalls safety related? Yes, sir, they were. And they could have resulted in fire and explosion? And some of them did. And death? And some of them did, yes, sir. I hope that doesn't come to surprise to you, Mr. Thomas. No, it doesn't, and I wasn't suggesting that that wasn't the case, Mr. Chairman, but I was trying to suggest that I was putting these recalls in, in uh, perspective with all the recalls that are dealt with as far as vehicles are concerned in the manufacturing process of a car. I don't think there's a question that you're going to eventually, at some time, run into no. problems and have to pull them back and correct them. It may be your engineers view this differently, but I have no desire to be driving with my family down the road in, in a car that is subject to a uh, fire explosion because of, uh, of, a, uh, of an emissions control device that is a hazard to me or my family or any of my constituents or other Americans. Mr. Chairman, we certainly share the same position on that as do I think all Americans, and we certainly don't intend to have those uh, controls on cars that present that kind of hazard, and I don't think we do. Um, let me observe this. Two firms, Exxon and Mobil, have fitted mid-sized passenger cars, two in number, which I observe are not the latest models, with onboard systems, and have shown them here and elsewhere uh, to demonstrate such systems can be built. I understand, Ms. Steed, that you recently examined these vehicles. Can you tell us about your views on the safety of these aftermarket type systems? Could they adequately meet safety requirements? Let me comment, uh, Mr. Chairman. We did look at those uh, vehicles earlier this week, and essentially what happened was it, it basically cons confirmed our views that uh, these onboard systems could be a problem in the sense that they use larger lines, they use uh, more complicated machinery, all of which might be subject to a problem uh, either in a crash, they'd have to do additional uh, work to, pr to protect these different kinds of, of attachments and, or, and or from, devices. Or from vibration or sudden impact. Yes, all of, the, all of the above, and one other concern that we have, and that is in, in uh, engine work or in any automotive maintenance work, perhaps a, a mechanic will inadvertently detach one of these lines or, or unattach one of these lines and perhaps not put it back together. We've seen problems of that nature also. I'd like to have George actually comment um, perhaps more technically please, on those Mr. cars. Parker. Go, go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we looked at both the uh, the two oil company uh, designs earlier this week, 
Uh, all of the manufacturer mock-ups that we've seen are based on the mobile system design, which we believe is more complex than the Exxon system design. The Exxon system design, we would say, is the, is the, uh, is the simplest design we've seen so far. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity, not seeing that earlier, to ask the manufacturers why they hadn't chosen that particular design. My understanding is that's been around for some time anyway. Uh, even the Exxon design, though, is an increment um, of complexity above current systems. There's a, in the mock-up they had, there is a combination valve that has to be mounted higher than the uh, filler neck opening. Uh, it's a liquid vapor separator. It's a float valve to shut off the, uh, the fuel nozzle. It's a rollover valve. The one thing that I saw that concerned me very much is that it moves the rollover valve, which is now on top of the gas tank, up to another location uh, so that in the rollover situation you'd have fuel in this line uh, that you wouldn't have in the current situation. You also have, in uh, my judgment anyway, increased the complexity of the fuel nozzle shutoff by putting this float in there. Um, so we see an increment of, of uh, complexity there that uh, you don't have with current systems. I would suspect from what we've seen in the number of recalls over the last 10 years that you would have, uh, that this would generate recalls also. And by the way, some of those recalls were not just for problems that developed because of design or production. They were non-compliances with our safety standards. Uh, I think there's been eight or ten cases where the evaporative system design itself, uh, because of either design problem or, again, a little bit production problem, has failed our 301 test and has resulted in a recall because of that. Now, Ms. Deed, you have been cited by EPA in letters to me as agreeing, and I now quote with the statement of EPA, that adequate lead time is a key, in, is a key ingredient in assuring the development of safe fuel system designs with onboard controls. I close quote. EPA said then, and I quote again, EPA and NHTSA staff agree on this point, and EPA is committed to providing manufacturers the lead time necessary to implement onboard control safety and effectively. However, the determination of how much lead time is actually needed to meet this objective should be handled with full public participation in the path of a proposed, as part of a proposed rule. EPA is willing to provide additional lead time and or short phase-in period for onboard controls, especially if these would clearly aid in solving safety problems. Now, I am curious. In your testimony, I do not perceive that you feel entirely certain or comfortable that lead time is the key ingredient and that there may be structural problems. Indeed, one does not know how long a period of time EPA is contemplating, how long the effective engineering would take, whether or not or how or when the issues of safety uh, could, in fact, be resolved. Um, what is your view? I certainly agree that, that lead time is absolutely essential if these uh, systems are to be ultimately required on cars, and I do not believe that the current two-year uh, proposal that EPA is looking at is sufficient. As far as what might be sufficient, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure that I can, I can project uh, accurately exactly what a, a sufficient lead time would be at this point, and we're anxiously awaiting the comments that will come in during the public comment period. But I will say this. I would think that at a minimum of, of something like four years might be required if everything went perfectly. But Manufacturers don't even have prototype systems at this point, nor will they have for a number of years that can be tested and crash tested, for example, so that we have absolute proof of whether or not these systems perform correctly. So lead time is a very important element. I am not completely convinced at this point that that's the only problem. But the, but, but the question of safety and the structural integrity of the system is, is important and it's resolution is not full, and, and the question, rather in questions relative to those matters, have not fully been resolved at this time. Is That's that correct. That, this is one of the things that we hope we will get uh, a greater comment on from the manufacturers themselves and from others. And you're, what you're saying is that at this particular time, we, can't, we cannot rule out the possibility of a significant safety degradation even with plenty of lead time. That's what I was trying to say. You, you kind of don't know what you don't know at this point because, again, they will not have even built a prototype system or, or a mock-up system that they can actually test for several years now. And even assuming everything went perfectly, that the designs that the engineers have theoretically proposed would be 
uh, safe systems. Even if that went perfectly, we cannot be sure that there might not be something in a manufacturing process or what have you that might cause these cars to be recalled. And with bad luck out there, we might have a lot of exploding and burning automobiles. And then it's too late. That's right. Thank you. Ms. Barnes? I'll try to be brief. I know you've been here a long time. Uh, Mr. Thomas, how many of the 62 ozone non-attainment areas do you believe will reach attainment via the onboard control system? As far as the uh, onboard control system, we project that that would result in about a 2 percent reduction nationwide in the overall inventory of volatile organics. If you look across the country, uh, you find that uh, the areas, uh, the 62 that you mentioned, uh, requiring reductions uh, require anywhere from a high of 75 percent down to a low of, of probably 15 or 20 percent or less. So obviously that 2 percent is only one small element of that overall reduction required. But it is an important element for a couple of reasons. One is there are not many options out there for that much of a percentage reduction from any single control. Uh, point. Most of them are less than 1 percent as far as sources are concerned. Secondly, it deals with our transport problem very well in that it is, is a control system that goes in place not just in non-attainment areas but attainment areas as well, as, 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 as well as vehicles going through attainment areas. So it gives us a, a, a better source of control in non-attainment areas in that respect. And finally, it deals with toxics uh, as far as the uh, components of gasoline that may have toxic uh, concerns uh, that are inhaled during refueling. So it has an added benefit in that regard. The GAO report on EPA's efforts to control vehicle refueling and evaporative emissions recommends the use of presenting control strategies in terms of net benefits. Did the agency analyze the control strategies in terms of total costs and benefits? And do you believe this analysis would change the relative merits of onboard versus stage two? We have analyzed that issue from every angle it could ever be analyzed, as have about anybody else that have looked at it and has, have talked about our analysis. Uh, based on that analysis, we feel that the net benefits of, of an onboard system are greater than the benefits of a stage two system, and that's why we chose that direction. It incorporates the various things I talked about, that is, both benefits in non-attainment, benefits in attainment, benefits from toxins. The GAO report also stated that there was little information to support the use of a 2,000 per ton benchmark for controlling emissions and determining cost effectiveness. Could you explain to the subcommittee how you got that 2,000 figure? $2,000 per ton. We, used, we, we did analysis using sensitivity analysis for range of cost as far as volatile organic controls are, are, are concerned. Uh, we find now, for instance, in California, uh, controls going in place substantially above that as far as cost are concerned. We feel that's a realistic figure if you uh, 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 look at controls in many non-attainment areas in this country, uh, but many of them are paying more than that. Is but we did a variety of analysis using a variety of costs. Is it tied to a benefit analysis? The whole thing was a part of a cost-benefit analysis. The 2000 figure? Yes, it was tied to a benefit analysis. We did a number of benefit analyses. Ms. Steed, in your testimony, you state that onboard vapor recovery systems will increase the opportunities for fuel su system fires, both in terms of crashes and in non-crash non -crash circumstances. What analysis do you base this conclusion on? This is based on our uh, looks at past activities with current systems, uh, current evaporative and current emission control systems. We've seen a number of recalls result from this kind of a problem with emission systems, and we feel that this might be the same, especially when you're looking at onboard systems and the prototypes that we've seen that increase the, the size of lines and the complexity, putting additional uh, devices, control devices, in areas that might be uh, totally involved in crash situations. What do you recommend to resolve some of the safety issues that have been raised today? I think we need to uh, sit our engineers down, and we intend to do this over the next couple of, of weeks. In fact, I intend to uh, go out to Ann Arbor very soon, along with my staff, and take a look at what the various problems that we might have are and where our disagreements are with, uh, with EPA on what some of the safety issues might be. They've drawn some conclusions based on engineering judgment. I think we're bringing some questions to bear that are based on on-road fact, and I think we need uh, further discussion of this. The, the process that has been set up on this particular rulemaking that would have us take a look at EPA's safety analysis that they will do after they receive all of the comments 
have us take a look at that, do our own safety analysis, and then the, as I understand it, this question will be reproposed for another public comment on the safety issues. And I think this process will allow us to resolve many of those issues, hopefully. Can you say whether you're optimistic that you will be able to resolve these issues, the safety issues? I think it's a little early to say that. I, I'm certainly not optimistic, as you can tell from my testimony today, but I think we have uh, considerable additional data and discussions to go before I could make that statement with any certainty. Can you tell me how the added complexity of onboard compares to features such as fuel injection? George, can you answer that? Well, I would say fuel injection systems are much more complex than what's being proposed here, or at least the simplest of the designs. By the way, I would also say that uh, when you take into account all of the uh, things you can to minimize the safety concerns, there still will be recalls because there's been evaporative emission standards uh, to be met for quite a long time and there's still recalls associated with those. So you can't ever eliminate all of the problems. Mr. Thomas, getting back to the uh, interim assessment report, and, and Dr. Culp, if you want to comment, what key uncertainties do you believe have been reduced in this report? And what important uncertainties do you think remain to be settled? Which have been reduced? Yeah, which have been reduced and what, which ones remain to be settled? Well, in our uh, executive summary, I think we list those. Uh, but to summarize briefly, <clears throat> we now have a, a very good understanding of the sources of the emissions and the amount of the emissions. We also have a rather good understanding of the emerging control technologies and their potential. We uh, understand the atmospheric chemistry rather well compared to five to ten years ago. We understand which of the precursors uh, are important and how they uh, are uh, modified in the atmosphere to produce the acids and the oxidants. So that was an area that was quite unknown. In fact, <clears throat> the importance of hydrogen peroxide was really not very well known even five years ago, and yet now we know it is the major oxidant producing acid rain in the eastern United States. So far as the deposition and air quality is concerned, we now have a, a very effective nationwide 150 and with the Canadians close to 250 stations that are continually monitoring the acid rain. So we know what is coming out of the sky quite accurately all over the country. We're just uh, in introducing this year a dry deposition network so we can measure the, the gases that come down and the particles that come down along with the wet. So that all of that has been accomplished during this period of time. As far as crops are concerned, we have learned that at ambient levels there is apparently no uh, impact, no negative impact, possibly a positive impact from fertilization, as we said, <coughs> but no, no negative impact uh, on the yield of crops. <coughs> we have found that <coughs> so far as seedlings were concerned uh, of various forest species that also there, <coughs> excuse me, that Again, with ambient levels of uh, sim simulated acid rain, we find no effect on the foliage, leading to an effect on either the photosynthesis or the growth of these seedlings. And presumably, that can be translated to the foliage of, of adult trees, but that involves a, a s another step. Those things we have pretty well established. And as far as the forests are concerned, the, the areas we have not established yet, which we hope to get some more light on by 1990, are two. We hope to understand those soils, if there are some, with small enough buffering capacity and small enough nutrient capacity so that the present levels of acid rain could actually impact the tree's growth negatively in the soil by leaching out nutrients or by affecting the microorganisms or some of these other things. <clears throat> That's for 1990. Also for 1990, <laughs> as I think I mentioned before, is to unscramble the relative importance of the air pollution impacts on the high altitude forests where we actually see damage. They're about the only places we really do see damage today. And <clears throat> how much of that is due to just going up the mountain and getting toward timberline where natural stresses are wiping out the forest, and how much are due to ozone, how much is due to acid rain, how much is due to hydrogen peroxide, we have to determine, and I think we will know that by 1990. So far as the aquatics are concerned, I think we have a good handle now on the chronic acidification, how many lakes are acidified. We know a little bit about the streams, but we need to learn more. One thing we haven't talked about this afternoon uh, is the matter of episodes, snow melt episode that would cause a pulse of acid water to go down the stream. How damaging is that? We don't know that very well. We know some of these streams and lakes where 
there is an acid pulse in the spring where there are no dead fish, nothing seems to happen. On the other hand, theory, biological theory, would suggest that some of the microorganisms, maybe some of the fish eggs, may be impacted negatively by, by this. And we hope to, to, to nail that down. We hope to know the frequency of the episodes, where they are, how much acidity, and how much they affect uh, life in those streams by, by 1990. The other thing we need to learn in aquatics is to, to be very sure, I was giving a lot of answers today about our belief that in the next few uh, decades there's not going to be much in the way of change if the missions stay about the same. We need to be very uh, quantitative about that, and particularly we need to try to understand how rapidly uh, in the southeast may we have some acidification coming on as the sulfate absorption in the soils gets saturated. Is it going to be a few decades till we see some change, or is it going to be centuries? In the latter case, I think it's academic. But we, we really don't know that, that rate of change uh, in the southeast soils, and we hope to know that. So far as materials are concerned, we know that uh, acidity can affect galvanized steel and can affect limestone uh, of various type, marbles. But at this time, we do not know quantitatively how much of an effect there is. What we need to, to complete are a whole series of experiments where we expose, let's say, the galvanized steel samples to natural environment, ultraviolet, freezing and thawing, natural rain and everything, but vary the amount of acidity. And once we've done that, we can then quantitatively say how important it is. And finally, uh, <clears throat> in terms of human health, which is not directly in the NAPAP charter, uh, but the human health question is, is rather wide open. We know that uh, you can have effects at high levels of ozone, high levels of SO2, high levels of acidic aerosols, but at ambient levels, there's no evidence of any damage. This requires very long-term, low-level experiments, which haven't been done yet. And uh, some of that may be accomplished by 1990, but we don't think it'll be answered. Thank you. Um, Mr. Peach, I understand that uh, management changes and structural problems within NAPEP may have caused it to uh, delay the issuance of some of its reports on time. But is there any reason to suspect from your work uh, that, the, that this management problem perhaps uh, affected the quality of NAPEP's research? I don't think there's any reason to expect that it affected the, uh, the quality of the research. Uh, one of the things we did refer to, though, and where Dr. Culp felt he had some disagreement was this issue of the staffing that is in the area and uh, the involvement when the, uh, uh, in effect, the person in Dr. Culp's position is both the chief scientist and carrying out a lot of administrative and other duties. And I think there is that kind of question of how you divide, how do you work those things up and out properly to have the proper staffing to bring the attention that's going to need to be brought between now and 1990. I think they've uh, identified a lot of things that are rather sizable tasks that still lie ahead of them that will require intensive effort between now and 1990 to have this effectively brought off and bring about the report we would like to have at the end of the 10-year period. Mr. Thomas, uh, you point out in your testimony that Canada is fundamentally different from the U.S. and that only seven sources, six smelters and one utility, account for over 60 percent of the sulfur dioxide emissions. You also point out that most of the SO2 emission reductions that have occurred in Canada since 1970 were the result of process changes at, those, at smelters uh, before 1979. Were those process changes made solely in order to reduce SO2 emissions or were they also made to respond to economic pressures to stay competitive? I think there was a combination of the two, both to comply with the ambient standard requirement of the Canadian program as well as obvious economic and production uh, 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 benefits. Do you believe that production declines that were made uh, previously in Canada in the smelting area will continue in the future so that Canada will, will have some added margin of flexibility in meeting its reduction targets? Uh, I, I, I really don't have information uh, at hand to predict uh, what I think the production changes may be as far as economics are concerned. Obviously, that has a major impact on the smelting industry, as we've seen in the past, both U.S. and Canadian. Uh, they do propose, as a part of their uh, acid rain control program, as far as reductions are concerned, uh, they're looking at additional uh, production modifications as far as some of their smelters are concerned and the addition of acid plants. In your report on Canada's air pollution control program, you point out that SO2 emissions from utility plants have actually increased by 54 percent between 1970 and 1984. 
Do you believe utility emissions in Canada will continue to increase? Uh, as I indicated, the Canadian mix of sources is very different from the U.S. And during the period of time where, uh, I mean, it, 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 when you look at U.S. emissions, they're largely from U utilities. In Can Canada, they're largely from smelters. And you're correct. During the same period of time that there were large reductions from smelters in Canada, there were actual increases from their utilities uh, as far as sulfur emissions are concerned. And as, you could, as was indicated, I think, by the chairman in a comment, over that period of time, then, you saw the mix, uh, the, the proportion of each to the overall emissions change. And you saw uh, more of the emissions from utilities because they did increase. As we look at, at the uh, Canadian program for the future, uh, they are projecting substantial reductions uh, as far as their utilities are concerned in most cases. I think there are some cases where there actually may be some increases. I believe uh, there may be the potential for some increases in Manitoba. We have heard reports that the Canadian government estimates that its <laughs> acid rain program will cost uh, utilities and industry 500, <laughs> 500 million per year. Do you agree with that figure and how does that compare with what the U.S. is spending on SO2 and NOx reductions? We really don't uh, have a basis and as the report indicated, there's not a basis for estimating the cost of the program because the government of Canada is in the process of implementing the program now and as to how they actually implement that program as far as technology controls or as far as production modifications. You have to, you have to complete that process before you can do a cost estimate. Uh, as you know, the program in the United States has been a a uh, heavily uh, technical program. Uh, it is a very expensive program. We spent billions and billions of dollars and continue to spend billions of dollars on that technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Um, this, this question, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that you support, as I do, the EPA rule to reduce the volatility of fuel. But I have received some concerns from the oil industry that the changeover period is, again, crucial, both from an economic but also from a safety standpoint because of the problem of mixing in underground tanks. And I'm curious, is the EPA estimate of lead time for this on or off the mark, Mr. Thomas? I believe that the, the lead time analysis that we did for volatility uh, utilized an awful lot of information on modifications to the refining industry. The model we used is one that, that DOE uses, and it was, it was really geared towards what kind of uh, uh, lead time the refining industry needed to make the modifications. And it also took into account uh, uh, the cost impact of that lead time, in other words, the the cost effectiveness of trying to have that volatility fuel modified, say, by, I mean, the volatility level modified by, say, 90 versus 92 is dramatically different because of the capital cost involved in the refining industry. So the model we used, we felt was on target as far as the refining model that came out of the Department of Energy's work. Well, you're aware but we, we obviously, we're taking comment on that. It's a staged reduction, as you know. We go 1990 and 1992. Uh, we, we did that as well based on information from the refining industry about when well, they actually could carry that off. Don't you have a problem, though, with the fact that during the summertime, uh, March or April. well, in March or April, the refineries change over. They begin running a lot of gasoline for the summer. <coughs> then they, then as August or September comes to hand, they begin changing over again to run a lot of diesel, a lot of heating oil, and those fractions. And they keep very large stored amounts of fuel on hand. So does the gas station. And this is true also with regard to the gas station, which has usually a very large inventory of gasoline on hand, as do the jobbers and the tank farms and so forth that, that engage in the commercial sale of gasoline, some of whom are not, in fact, refiners. And you mix the two things. When you, first of all, you have two problems. One is the annual problem of the changeover. The other is the, is the problem of changing the rules so that the components of gasoline become different. Have you considered carefully this question of lead time, Mr. Thomas, in this I regard? Think we, I, I, think we have, I think we have incorporated in our model the uh, uh, refining 
uh, requirements as far as the changes in fuel, fuel needs for refining over the course of the year. In other words, as you indicated, the changes as far as summer months versus winter months and what kind of fuel needs there are. I think those kind of uh, components are incorporated into that model. As you know, the volatility rule we've proposed is a summertime volatility rule. Now let's, let's go to another question here. Let us address the question of vapor pressure and the question of R RVP levels when there are blends like ethanol added. One of, the, one of the proposals that you were considering at EPA, Mr. Thomas, is the question of reducing volatility levels. I want to see ethanol as a viable industry because it's important, I think, to the country. But if you deal with this question in certain ways, you wind up with some curious situations. As I've indicated, I support a reduction of RVP. I'm told that the ethanol industry wants vapor pressure considered after, rather before the ethanol is added rather than after the ethanol is added. What would the consequences of this be in terms of changing vapor pressure from the rule that you would draft and what would be the consequences in terms of safety and environment, both in the winter and the summer, and in, and in, and in questions relative to vehicle certification? Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure I can respond uh, at this point to all of the aspects of your question. But as you know, we've proposed uh, several alternatives for comment as far as uh, uh, ethanol is concerned are alcohol blended fuels. Uh, looking at, uh, uh, for instance, is one option requiring the same volatility level for blended fuels as gasoline. But as you indicated, that presents some significant issues for the ethanol industry or the alcohol fuels industry. We proposed as an option a one pound increase. Now, uh, much of the eth ethanol is blended not at the refinery, but uh, uh, basically Later. in the distribution system. Uh, and so there is an issue about whether that one pound additional would be at the refinery or actually would be at the, at the pump uh, that has been raised. Uh, the, the whole issue of what implications this has for the alcohol fuel blending industry uh, and the whole issue of uh, what benefits there are of not allowing an increase in ethanol are all a part of the comment period we're trying, I mean, the comments that we're trying to get on these issues as we go through looking at these various options. We have not come down, EPA has not come down and proposed one option. We propose several to take comment on. The consequences, though, of the proposals of the ethanol industry are to essentially increase the vapor pressures, are they not? If you, if you allow them a one pound break, in other words, an, uh, an increase of 10 PSI as opposed to 9 on blended fuel, that's exactly what you've done. You've increased the vapor pressure. Right, what does that do to certification? I mean, that's, that's significantly lower than it is today now, but I mean, it would be obviously that one pound. It's about one pound a day difference, I believe. It's still higher than what you propose. That's correct. Well, I mean, that's correct because we proposed nine pounds for gasoline, ultimately, and so one of the alternatives we looked at for alcohol fuels was 10 pounds. We also proposed having them the same as, as gasoline. What would that do in terms of safety and certification? Can you want to comment, Ms. Steed? In terms of safety, the commingling of, of an alcohol blended fuel we think could raise the volatility of fuel and from that standpoint we do have some concerns along with some of the other safety properties of some of these. It uh, could have some safety, it, it could create some safety problems. It could and it's something that we want to look further into because we, uh, we are, don't have any particular expertise in this area. We're just beginning to look at it and beginning to look at volatility in terms of uh, some of the fires we've seen in recalls. Ms. Thomas, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think, for instance, one of the advantages if we had blended fuel of uh, the onboard system would be that it would uh, have excess capacity to deal with the uh, excess uh, volatility of that particular gasoline. Uh, but the overall point you make about whether you have some increased volatility with a blended gasoline, 
and that volatility relates to concerns about safety is, is, is a very valid point. That's, that is one of the issues that we're trying to take a look at. As would, Ms. Steed indicated, I think it's exactly one of the issues that their agency is trying to take a look at as well. Would this require the petroleum or the auto industry to do more than one certification? Let's say one certification at 9 and one certification at 10? Or, which, or, or to, which, to which vapor pressure would you require the vehicles to be certified? To 9 or to 10? The proposal was nine, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I just don't have the full answer to your question. Well, you, you'd require them to certify at nine, but then you'd allow them to run with fuel at ten. What would be the environmental consequences of that? The environmental consequence, if you had a, a, uh, a capacity for, uh, of your canister that was designed for nine, would be an excess evaporative emission of that one extra pound. So, so that would require a change in the canister to deal with both safety and emission problems with regard to ten. I just don't have a full answer to that question, Mr. Well, it, Chairman, it could, at this point it, in time. It, could you provide that for the record? I'd be glad to. It could, however, impact both the size of the canister, the safety of the system, uh, how, you would, how you would certify, whether you would certify it for 9 pounds or 10 pounds, whether or not, and, and it could require you to require that the certification process go on twice, once with regard to 9 pounds and once with regard to 10 pounds. Isn't that so? may have all of those implications. How about that, Ms. Steed? What are your comments? I can't speak to specifically to the <laughs> certification problems because that's, uh, that's an EPA process. But yes, we would agree with you that it could have a, a canister problem, could create safety problems. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've kept you here a long time. You have been very patient, very forthcoming. The committee is very grateful to those who have appeared on the panel. We thank you all. We also thank your associates who have been here with you this morning. And the uh, chair does advise that uh, there will be probably some additional questions for the record. Mr. Sikorsky has indicated that he has some, and it may be that some others will, will uh, develop. In any event, ladies and gentlemen, the, the committee thanks you all for your patience and your assistance. Thank you very much. You've been watching a hearing on acid rain issues before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. If you'd like more information, you can contact the subcommittee in room 2125 of the Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., and the zip code is 20515. You're watching C-SPAN, the Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network, a nonprofit cooperative of this and other cable television companies. C-SPAN where the Constitution comes to life every day.